Broughton. Here. Chen. Cisneros. Here. Dela Cruz. Here. Dellen. Here. Ganong. Here. Pertula. Here. Shelby. Present. Sowell. Here. Stallings. Here. Tony. Here. Chair and Vice Chair, everyone is present except for Trustee Chen, and we will keep an eye out in the participant panel for her. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, so those of you uh, who are familiar with our group may have noticed two new names in the roll call this morning, and I'm very excited and pleased to welcome our two newest board members to the fold, um, Mr. Mark Tony and Ms. Melanie Shelby. Welcome, fellow trustees. Congratulations on your appointments. Uh, we're looking forward to working with you uh, on the important work of the State Bar. Um, I understand that you have been sworn in and are ready to discharge your duties. Would you care to take a minute or two to introduce yourselves to your colleagues on the board and to the public? Ms. Shelby, you want to go? Perfect. First of all, Happy New Year and good morning to you all. Very excited to join you. My name is Melanie Shelby. And I serve as Managing Director at Gray Greer Shelby and Vaughn, a minority and woman-owned public affairs firm. Um, prior to that, founding the firm 13 years ago, um, I spent 10 years as an energy lobbyist in Washington, D.C., Sacramento, and doing regulatory work. So um, very excited about the charge that is ahead. And um, unfortunately, even though we cannot assemble together, I certainly look forward to connecting with each and one of every one of you when we have the opportunity to connect in person. So thank you. Thank you. Trustee Tony. Thank you very much uh, for the warm welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Tony. I serve as executive director of TURN, the Utility Reform Network. I also serve on the board of directors of ACLU Northern California. I am a organizer by trade, a sociologist by discipline, and a troublemaker at heart. So I um, have had a good deal of experience with uh, particularly in the nonprofit field uh, uh, on having served on various boards and um, having served as executive director of several organizations. And I'm committed to bringing my passion for uh, racial justice and equity and access and inclusion um, and good governance uh, to contribute to restoring the reputation of the California State Bar. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Melanie. Once again, welcome. And, and just to echo Melanie's sentiments, hopefully one day soon we can all be together uh, physically. Um, but in the meantime, it is, again, I say good to be here with all of you virtually. Uh, thank you to the members of the public who have joined us. This is uh, our first meeting of the year, and we are back to the two-day um, at a, at a time meeting uh, because there's a lot of important work to be done uh, to launch off the work of our organization for the coming year. Uh, to that end, on our agenda this morning is a strategic planning session. I hope that you all have received the, uh, the materials in preparation for this morning. Um, you'll, you'll note that there are some, some pretty big issues um, and it's not gonna surprise you to know that uh, the State Bar staff has spent quite a bit of time uh, preparing the presentations and the discussion uh, outline that we're going to have this morning. And so um, I will start off by thanking Donna and her staff for your, your, your good work in um, setting the table for us this morning. Uh, all of these are important issues um, that the bar will have to and is facing uh, in, these very, um, in these very challenging times that we find ourselves in. Uh, because this is a public meeting, um, we are required and we welcome public input on our agenda item. Um, so if there are any members from the public who wish to speak to the strategic planning uh, that we have on the agenda this morning before we start, I will open the floor to that and you would have uh, up to three minutes to provide comments to the board. Madam Clerk, do we know whether there's anybody who wishes to speak? Um. 
Jag McLeod will, will be handling the public comment for this meeting. Uh, thank you, Mr. McLeod. So I'm not seeing any hands. We have a, typically what we when we have public comment is we um, ask people to go ahead and use the uh, virtual hand raise, the blue hand icon at the bottom of their screen if they're um, calling in using a computer or uh, to indicate that they're interested in making public comments. Um, I don't see any hands raised in the um, attendee list yet. Um, so maybe give it another 10 seconds, 15 seconds for people to um, alert us if they're interested in making public comments. Okay, I'll hang tight for a sec. Looks like I think, not. I think we're good. I don't see any, anybody indicating that they're interested in making a comment. Okay, I'll close the public comment period and hand the microphone, as it were, over to Ms. Herskowitz to kick us off. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, good morning, everyone. I too want to officially wish everybody a happy 2021 uh, and welcome you all to the State Bar Board of Trustees annual planning session. Um, the annual planning session is an opportunity to step back from the important action items that the board is asked to consider at regular board meetings to dig deeply into a couple of areas um, that are outlined in the current strategic plan. Um, it's an opportunity to make sure that we're we're on track and headed in the right direction to move the needle on the important goals and objectives that have been established by the Board of Trustees. Today's planning session is divided into two distinct parts. This morning, the board will discuss elements of the attorney discipline system. This afternoon, the board will turn its focus to uh, access to justice, discussing the work of the paraprofessional program. I will talk more about that latter piece as we introduce that section of today's agenda. Um, but I did want to take a moment, a quick moment, um, to introduce the first part of your agenda this morning. Um, as our tenured board members will recall, um, in prior years, um, State Bar staff, uh, along with the presiding judge of the State Bar Court, would provide a primer on the attorney discipline system, walking you at a high level through the various offices that are involved in the attorney discipline system. Um, today's session is not that. Um, for today, staff, uh, working very closely with the chair and the vice chair of the Regulation and Discipline Committee, put together what we intend and we, we hope will be a thought, a thought and discussion pro provoking plan to highlight some of the work that we're currently doing in risk-based regulation and proactive regulation, and to begin discussions with the board about possible future directions to ensure a more fair and effective discipline system for all parties who are involved. We'll be discussing possible approaches to reduce the incidence of misconduct, approaches to ensuring that actions are taken in the interest of public protection, options for changing some of the ways in which we prioritize how cases move forward, and more effective allocation of resources. We wanted to spend the bulk of the planning session today on this topic for a number of reasons. Obviously, the attorney discipline system is a substantial part of the work of the State Bar. Um, it is work for which we are and should be held accountable. The majority of our resources go to support this function and it is critical to the State Bar's mission to protect the public. However, you know, maybe, maybe the sort of the more real reason that we are focusing this attention is to have the board start these important discussions, which will inf ultimately inform the work of the ad hoc commission on the discipline system um, to which the board will actually be appoint asked to appoint members to uh, tomorrow. And we anticipate that the board will, see, will receive updates on the progress of the ad hoc commission as it conducts its work and may be implement, asked to implement policy or rule changes throughout their process. Today gives us a real opportunity to, to continue to think seriously about these important issues and shaping our thoughts for how to address changes that the ad hoc commission may bring to you. Um, so um, unless the chair uh, has further comments, um, I'd like to hand the, the proverbial mic over to Dag McLeod, the State Bar's Chief of Mission Advancement and Accountability, who will be facilitating this section of the planning session. I've got nothing further, Dag, please, please take us. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Chair Duran. Um, good morning, trustees. Happy New Year. Uh, welcome to our newest trustees. Um, I prepared some comments and some slides. And Donna, I think is, I, I had a brief moment when I thought, you know, I'm just gonna skip them because I think Donna's really um, 
we're on the same page in terms of what we're attempting to do. So, but, but rather than skip them, I think I'm gonna go through them very, very quickly um, because I think that there's some, some valuable level setting here. Um, and uh, I think that what I also want to accomplish in, term, in addition to doing some quick level setting, uh, which is very similar to what Donna said, I wanna build on some previous work and just call that out. And then also, as Donna mentioned, I think what our real goal here today is to begin charting a path forward for the ad hoc um, commission on the discipline system. The first thing I wanted to do in terms of level setting is I wanted to talk about the, um, these are the three goals, level setting, building on previous work, charting the path forward. In terms of the level setting, what Donna mentioned about the attorney discipline system being the largest part of the state bar's work, I wanted to call that a little slightly more specifically because when you look at the work that the state bar does, the Office of Chief Trial Counsel by itself consists of half of the staff, roughly half of this entire staff of the state bar work in the Office of Chief Trial Counsel. This is the highest profile work that we do. It's what the legislature is most concerned about. It's what we are continually, work, continually working to refine and improve. The Chief Trial Counsel though is one part of the discipline system. The discipline system also consists of the state bar court, an independent adjudicatory body. And we need to keep in mind also that the discipline system consists of the Office of Professional Competence. The very rules of the road are sometimes crafted and interpreted uh, in the Office of Professional Competence. So what constitutes attorney misconduct? You'll even be seeing on uh, your agenda tomorrow for the board meeting, a very important um, analysis of the responsibilities and duties of district attorneys when they receive contributions for law enforcement. So. We have another important component of the discipline system that's contained within the Office of Professional Competence. Um, and then another piece of the discipline system that we, we need to keep in mind as well in the Office of Professional Support and Client Protection, not only work that's done to prevent misconduct by supporting attorneys who may be suffering from mental health or substance abuse related issues in the lower assistance program, but also the tracking and support for attorneys who are placed on probation so that they can complete their terms of probation and return to the practice of law, as well as reimbursement of victims of attorney misconduct in the client security fund, all housed within the Office of Professional Support and Client Protection. These are all components of the attorney discipline system. And even though our work often gets focused much, almost exclusively on the Office of Chief Trial Counsel, I think it's important to keep these other parts of the discipline system in mind as we move forward. The other part of the level setting that I just wanted to mention is that I think we often uh, analogize to the criminal justice system because it's a good analogy and it's what we're probably most familiar with. Um, and there are many ways in which the Office of Chief Trial Counsel and the attorney discipline system is similar to the criminal justice system. And I just wanted to note a couple. The discipline system has a prosecutor's office, that's OCTC. Uh, OCTC investigates allegations of misconduct just like uh, a district attorney might do. OCTC files charges when evidence of misconduct is found. And the accused, well, what we call the respondent in the attorney discipline system, the accused have due process rights. They may be represented by defense counsel. Respondents can have their cases heard by an independent impartial judge. That's where the state bar court comes in. And judgments can be appealed. In the case of the attorney discipline system, appeals can reach all the way up to the Supreme Court. I think that the analogy, we need to be careful of the analogy because it only goes so far. And when we start getting into the details of the attorney discipline system, and as we start moving forward in setting priorities for the ad hoc commission on the attorney discipline system, I think it's important also to think about the ways in which the uh, attorney discipline system is different from the criminal justice system. Uh, the issues that I would point out um, that are important differences between the attorney discipline system and the criminal justice system of the following. One is that the standard of evidence is not um, what we're most familiar with in the criminal justice system in terms of beyond a reasonable doubt. The standard of evidence in the attorney discipline system is clear and convincing. Something between the standard of evidence and standard for civil cases and for criminal cases. Not preponderance of the evidence, not beyond a reasonable doubt, but clear and convincing. Office of Chief Trial Counsel also lacks some of the tools that district attorneys have. Um, again, tying this to the agenda and the ongoing work of the Board of Trustees, 
you'll see on our legislative priorities that we're going to be presenting to the uh, executive committee today and then having seeking to, to have approved by the full board tomorrow. Um, we have a number of legislative priorities related to improving the tools that OCTC has so that they can get information that they need from justice system partners that would, would make their investigation of attorney misconduct more effective. Another important difference in terms of the attorney discipline system uh, and how it's different from the criminal justice system is that there is no law enforcement body uh, along the lines of a police and a state bar police. There's no, for, for whatever flaws we have seen in the, the execution of law enforcement and the challenges faced by law enforcement in the, in the last year and beyond, there is, no, there is no body for the state bar that, that searches for misconduct or, or identifies it and brings a case to the Office of Chief Trial Counsel with a shared understanding of what constitutes misconduct. Instead, it's up to the public, it's up to clients of attorneys to say that they were wrong and to bring that to Office of Chief Trial Counsel. And that creates special challenges for the Office of Chief Trial Counsel and additional work in terms of trying to understand what exactly happened and whether what happened and what may have been a, a bad experience for a client of an attorney was actually misconduct, can actually be disciplined. Another difference between OCTC's work and that of a criminal justice system prosecutor is that OCTC's discretion is more limited than that of a district attorney's office. We're going to hear a little bit more about that today. Um, and the prioritization of cases, this is a relatively new thing in Office of Chief Trial Counsel, an important um, uh, innovation in the office. But we need to note that it's not a shared prioritization of uh, cases that is, that is acknowledged by other parts of the system. So whereas OCTC now has a system for identifying those cases that pose the, the greatest potential risk of harm to the public, there's not a shared understanding in the way that say, in a, a criminal justice system, everyone recognizes that a felony is distinct from a, a misdemeanor and that a misdemeanor is distinct from an infraction. The, the sanctions that adhere to those different types of cases provides a hierarchy that helps, I think, the system work in terms of prioritization of the work and prioritization of, say, public safety in the, in the criminal justice system, but that we don't exactly have within the attorney discipline system. So turning very quickly to previous work on the attorney discipline system, and this is, this is the one that I will move past the most quickly. We've, we've seen major organizational changes and restructuring over the last five years. I started the, at the bar, my five-year anniversary will be April, and we were engaged in a major undertaking providing a report to the legislature at that time, a mandated report uh, on workforce planning, where we proposed major organizational changes and restructuring, many of which were implemented. We also had uh, the implementation of a brand new case management system between the last five years and now. Uh, uh, there's been an expansion of the commitment to addressing non-attorney unauthorized practice law in the operation of case prioritization in the Office of Chief Trial Counsel. I'm looking at something on my screen that said my internet connection is unstable. I hope I wasn't frozen for everyone. Dag, as a matter of fact, it was a little- Study and implementation. I'm sorry, Dag. Uh, your last 30- No, 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 go ahead. were a little jumbly. If you wouldn't mind restating that, because it looked like there was some important stuff in there. Uh, and restating which comments, Ruben? Just the last 30 to 45 seconds of the um, last bullet point, maybe the second to last as well. Oh, no, you were on- So, the, so the, the OC- Cutting out at UPL. Okay, so I think the point here was simply that, that we have, and this is the challenge I think of the ad hoc commission will be to coordinate, bring together the many different strands of work that have been conducted in the last four to five years, which involve major organizational changes and restructuring, some of which was mandated by the uh, legislature in a report that we submitted in 2016 on workforce planning. Um, also, there was the implementation of a new case management system in itself. I think a fairly traumatic event for any organization is like taking your case management system 
and and implementing a new one. I, I've seen it happen in other organizations, and it's not a it's it's not an easy thing to do, and it really transforms the work. Um, we've seen an expansion of OCT's commitment to addressing non-attorney unauthorized practice of law. I think that this is a challenging area, in particular, insofar as these are not cases where OCTC has. Uh, the tool, the principal tool that it has available to it in addressing attorney unauthorized, uh, attorney misconduct, which is the disbarment or suspension of an attorney. A non-attorney is not, does not fall under our jurisdiction. And so uh, Office of Chief Trial Counsel needs to work with local law enforcement, local district attorneys to see what can be done about the non-attorney unauthorized practice of law. OCTC um, has developed and implemented a case prioritization system, which we're going to hear a lot more about today. OCTC uh, and the uh, Office of Research and Institutional Accountability have studied and implemented a number of major recommendations related to disproportionate discipline. And uh, last year, the task force on governance and the public interest made recommendations on risk-based regulations Another item that we're gonna hear a lot about, and we're actually going to start with some uh, level setting regarding risk-based regulation and what it is. So charting the path forward, uh, the Ad Hoc Commission on the Discipline System has been charged with uh, creating an inventory of the changes that have been proposed and implemented in OCTC, evaluating the efficacy of the system for preventing future attorney misconduct, and with the participation of State Bar Court, examining the structure of the court and principally issues involving its independence and autonomy. I would like to turn it over now to Professor Tara Sklar. Professor Tara Sklar was our principal consultant on the Governance and the Public Interest Task Force uh, and helped write the report that we produced last year for that task force. Professor Sklar is uh, not only a professor of health law at the University of Arizona, James E. Rogers School of Law. She's the director of the health law and policy program there. She's a regular contributor to National Public Radio, public broadcasting system. And in recent years, she's expanded her work to evaluate uh, the legal profession and the regulation of law. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Professor Sklar. Great, thank you so much for the welcome and introduction, Dak. Um, can everybody hear and see me? Great. Yep. I'll, go, I'll go ahead and share, um, get my slides ready to share with you as well as I'm getting there. All right, does that look okay? Okay, so <laughs> it's amazing how Zoom has become our reality, but it's always good to just double check that everybody's seeing and hearing what I hope that they are. Um, I am at University of Arizona. I, I, however, I do live in Washington, D.C., so yesterday was a particular, well, all week, well, <laughs> for quite some time, it's been a, an exciting place to be. Um, so, uh, but today was, was a very peaceful morning, and um, I, uh, I have had the pleasure of working with um, Dag and his team for um, uh, since this past March when I first came to Los Angeles to work on this, these issues. And so this will be a nice update from where we've come um, since then. Um, I thought given your agenda for today, I could just take a quick moment to say, what is risk-based regulation? And I'll go into more detail, but I thought from just, you know, I, I, uh, the looking at it from a from a big lens, like why, like what is this exactly? What is the approach? And I think basically what we're what, I, what we've been trying to work out is it's a, it's a type of framework where you get thousands and thousands of um, complaints with potential allegations against California attorneys. Like where to even start with all of that? And so this is just a a, a way to think about taking all those potential all those allegations of potential misconduct and looking at them in a consistent and transparent way through a four-step process, um, which I put here, where it's really you need to look at the data, how it comes in, and we'll get to ways that these hotspots can emerge. But when you have when you look at thousands of potential allegations of misconduct versus you know case by case, you can really start to see some patterns and what we call hotspots that begin to emerge. And then based off that, we work on some interventions 
and which you can deploy resources, um, you know, based off the data that you're getting. So it's very targeted. And then, and then the fourth step, an ongoing step, is an evaluation piece, just to make sure that whatever the bar is engaged in, it's really meeting your goals of um, cost benefit, whatever metrics you have in terms of overall reducing the rate of complaints or misconduct or increasing the complaining witness or the, the client experience. Um, so I thought that would be helpful just to think about that there is a framework in which you're trying to fit um, or align what you're doing um, with, with many of the with goals that you have today and, and going forward. Um, so, what, so what happened, how I became involved was this past March, I got to come to your governance uh, uh, a task, uh, governance task force, go, sorry, task force and governance and public interest meeting. And um, and, and, I, and I shared with that group, which is some of you are here on this call, um, my experience in Australia with what I did with the state bar there. And then based off that, um, together uh, uh, with DAG and others, we worked on this, this report. And the, the bottom um, takeaway, three, through the three takeaways from it, was that they really wanted to get a better sense of the data. Um, and I think there's been some nice, um, uh, updates there that uh, you're here from uh, Lisa Chavez right after me uh, with, with the work they've been doing in that area that I've been helping to give input on. Um, and along with that, some potential interventions, uh, which I know the OCTC and, and um, DAG and Lisa are engaged in. And then this overall pathway, when you think about how to be more inclusive of the, of the legal experience, how that does involve clients um, and complaining witnesses. Um, and, that, and that is where the, where the data comes from at this point. It comes from complaints primarily. So those were the three uh, major takeaways that came out of the work so far to focus on those areas. And, and you can see how they fit with that previous slide with the, the four-step framework that I, I just showed. Um, so what I'll be talking about for the next 15 minutes or so is uh, a little a little bit more detail about risk-based regulation because it might be a, a somewhat new concept for some of you on the call. Um, and then how it has been applied in the legal profession as well as in other professions, namely um, with physicians, which is more, more my experience, but there's lots of commonality between doctors and lawyers and, um, and how they're regulated. And then, and then some of the things that, um, that's being explored right now with the California State Bar. Uh, so this is always important, I think, with any project, what, how, and why, uh, to what it is exactly. So I'll just do that now with risk-based regulation. So um, these are some of the four key features that I, I touched on with the, the four-step slide, but I think this picture image really speaks a lot to what you're trying to do here. I think that there are just over a quarter of a million registered lawyers in the California state that you are overseeing. So it's not really a question of whether to build a fence, but probably how many fences to build, where to build them, and how high to make them. And the idea that you can do that with is if you have data saying, well, it looks like we got thousands of complaints in this one area of law for this one <laughs> type of law, if that, if that exists with the data, how can we really you know, target our resources and build our fence in that way to help prevent potentially future complaints? Um, it's saying we're going to take a, a step away from looking at individual cases, but these overall patterns with caseload, as many of you know, you want to look at the forest, um, not just the trees, and the um, and then focusing on on the potential risk and probabilities. That means like trying to get to what could be misconduct before it occurs at a more severe level or to more of the public if possible, and 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 with any type of um, quality assurance, there just has to be this ongoing built-in evaluation of what we're doing. Is it really having the effect that you're hoping it, it will have? Um, so how it can be applied? I already spoke to, you know, as much as possible, you want it to be this very forward-looking, mitigate harm before it occurs as much as possible. And then one way to do that is through this idea that you want to reach out to lawyers perhaps earlier on in their career. So at, at this point in time, you know, when the vast majority of complaints are dismissed, the respondent um, may not even be aware that there could have been an issue. So there are potentially ways to rethink how that is currently being done going forward with um, notifying the, the lawyer that the complaint's been made, um, if that's warranted, and the potential outreach and education. So as, so I thought Dag really did a great job setting this up with the slides that you have the OCTC, but you also have the OPC, um, 
and just um, other, other offices that really work out these ways to work with lawyers who may be at risk for who may have committed misconduct or be at risk for potential misconduct. And it doesn't have to be this, this binary choice where it's either discipline or don't discipline, but really what we're trying to get to with a risk-based regulatory approach is there's, there's a third option of um, really doing educational and outreach, as well as I'd like to mention, because there's been so much more focus on the complaining witness, thinking about the client and potentially very vulnerable clients, those who um, may have, have immigration issues, maybe English is a second or third language, you know, there could be other other, other issues that really make them much more susceptible um, and not a good advocate for themselves when they are dealing with a, uh, a, question, a lawyer of questionable conduct. So, so that's why I just like to include that there's many pathways that we can take with this type of framework. Um, and the ultimate idea is to become good stewards, that you're not just, um, that you have real uh, a real process for how you're deploying your resources. It's, you can show it through the data why this made sense, um, and that's very that's great for transparency. And that's an issue that's um, that the bar has been very focused on. Um, where not just to protect public from harm, but to show how you're doing it um, through data and through your actions and with your resources. And then I think that the idea of equity and inclusion, and I heard one of your new members touch on in the very beginning, I thought was, was right to the point where um, as much as possible to, to think about how to how you may or may not be addressing the complaining witness um, in, this, in this process, which I think a risk-based regulatory approach really does allow for. Um, when you're thinking about, again, uh, trying to uh, uh, trying to think about the whole process from the whole pathway from how a complaint may happen to how it's resolved. So um, within the legal, I'll talk about now about the legal profession that does touch on what we do in healthcare and, um, and then some things that are happening in California. So um, my background is as a, a mainly in healthcare, and um, and I did get involved in this initially because there's been so much more research done on doctors and risk-based regulation than lawyers to this point in time. I have to say that the California State Bar is really a forerunner uh, with legal regulators around the world. People nowhere on the scale and nowhere um, anywhere near the holistic approach that you're trying to take. So it's very admirable that you're stepping into this. Um, so, but in general, uh, between doctors and client, uh, patients and, and lawyers and clients, you do have this, this imbalance um, with, in many different ways. And, and in some ways, there's even more of an imbalance between lawyers and clients than with doctors and patients, because for some people, uh, the first time they see a lawyer or go to court, they could be in an extremely vulnerable position, whereas in healthcare, we go to the doctor all the time and you're just much more used to that setting. So it's just something to think about in some ways a client can be much more vulnerable than even a patient, even though you may not always be dealing with health or life or death issues. Both deal with a complaint-based system. Um, they both have regulatory models with licensing and um, renewing licensing annually. And then what I think is quite interesting about the two is these patterns with clustering or frequent flyers. What I mean by that is on this, on this slide, you'll see on the top two rows, these are primarily uh, studies done with physicians. And these are some of my co-authors that did these previous studies where you know, of, the, of all the physicians, really only this very small number, 3% account for more than half of the complaints. And then um, in the study I did at the bottom, uh, with, with these co-authors was focused on lawyers, but we found the exact same pattern that really only 4% of um, all the lawyers we studied in, in, in Australia, in the state of Victoria, Australia, accounted for over half the complaints. So in that sense, um, it almost looks like an inverted triangle where you have your, you have 250,000 lawyers in your case, and then you have the complaints, and then um, you narrow down with well, this many actually seem severe enough that we're going to deploy, deploy resources, investigate, and then of that, this really does result in some kind of misconduct finding or disbarment. So that's generally, even though we're talking about different countries and different professions and um, disciplines, this is this is a very uh, consistent um, way to think about how a regulator views the whatever area they're focused on. 
um, and what, how we approached it from um, my experience in Australia that seems to be helpful to replicate in some ways here in California, is we really tried to look at, well, what are the characteristics of those lawyers, of those 4% that seem to have a much higher rate of complaints, and some of them were eventually disbarred? What, what did they look like compared to the other lawyers that hadn't had, received any complaints? Were there differences? Were they significant? So that's what that one paper is about that's been published in the Journal of Empirical Legal Studies. Um, I think in 2018, and then we did a follow-up paper that really looked down, look, looked at some of the, the cases where about a third of the lawyers were disbarred and they had much more, you know, hundreds of complaints and much more severe uh, allegations against them. And we tried to identify, well, could there be issues aside from just intentional, wanting some kind of self-interest or intentional harm, could there be other things going on? And so that's when we discovered that there was a great deal of other patterns, including personal health and financial, that did lead to overall poor legal performance. And if that's the case, and that's just where you kind of want to think about how can an intervention be most effective? Is it on sanctions or is it on trying to maybe somehow support these health, financial, personal issues before they could erupt um, into the legal performance. Um, so based off that, there's another theoretical framework <laughs> that, um, that's also been adapted a great deal within the, the healthcare domain, where you look at, you know, this way you're uh, getting in touch with the respondent, there could be an issue here with, the, with your performance. Um, and then we, we have different interventions, which you'll hear about in a minute, that um, we've been trying here in California. We've done some in Australia. There's certainly been some in the medical profession. But basically, um, because sanctions kind of a last resort anyway, what can you kind of do in between to even mitigate that harm or before you even need to get to that point? Am I, okay, let me know if I, if I need to stop at any point or speed up, please, Dad. Um, so the... Uh, the issues, and this came up earlier with um, when Dag spoke about like, how we think about complaints. There are um, there aren't very many triggers available to let the bar know that someone could be having an issue that um, that needs to that could be addressed unless the public lets them know. Um, and so that is helpful um, from that in, that in one of those contexts that, uh, you know, has a violation potentially occurred, you can investigate it. It is certainly a, a helpful and important way to, to know if there's been um, an issue of uh, misconduct. Um, but, you know, the vast majority of the time, these are dismissed. And that's also the case in California in 2019, over 13,000. So it's, it's, a, it's a very high number of where complaints are dismissed, where maybe there potentially could have been action depending on the issue in a way to mitigate harm before more, more occur, occurs. There are also many reasons for not following a complaint. Um, I mean, many times, I don't think that the public generally knows that they can follow a complaint or where to go or how to do it or do the how to do it correctly. So we're not, I think of the ones that even come in, and then the math, and then so many of those are dismissed. There's even more that you just aren't even aware of because they, the public didn't know they could file. They could be fearful of retaliation. Maybe they don't trust the system, um, or they're of a, a vulnerable group. And then also, what tends to happen with some, a lot of these complaints, as you as you may know or may become familiar with, um, they're focused on what the public sees. So they're focused on communication issues or cost and billing issues, but, it, but they may not actually, there may be more serious things happening in terms of how they were represented, but they were, weren't even aware it was an issue. So lastly, I'll get into what's happening now in California. Um, the, uh, we have focused on the data, right? And so that's been a very exciting project that Ms. Chavez will get more into, but um, we're really trying to drill down much more closely on what the complaint is really about. So for example, um, one thing we might do more explicitly now is code for sexual impropriety. That's something that hadn't been done previously that we may do going forward. Um, or issues of, um, you know, potential communication, you know, how, what, what was that really? Was that no communication? Was it rudeness? Was it threatening? Um, and so those types of uh, questions, I think it's helpful when you develop an intervention to really drill down as much as you can um, to, and then to, and to see patterns across the caseload, what could that look like? So I look forward to um, Ms. Chavez describing that in more detail, but that's something we've been doing with the data. 
And then, um, the, and also there's now a complaining witness survey. I believe it's called the Access and Fairness Survey. And that's trying to get a sense from not not only following the complaint, but the whole experience of the client and, and doing so and how they were treated throughout the process. And could there be patterns or more resources there that the bar could, could help with? Um, and the last two items are things that we're still sort of exploring. And that's looking at potentially doing case file review, um, uh, where you get a sense of, well, when you look at the actual cases, maybe there's a difference in the regulatory response required um, when someone may be committing an act because they were self-serving and dishonest versus they were just having a very difficult personal and financial time. And, you know, certainly coming out of COVID, that, that will become something that is a reality for many. And then lastly, this idea of self-assessment, which I know OPC is um, also looking into. And I'll just touch on some ideas to think about when that comes up. Um, so the idea with the case file review, um, again, is just thinking about, uh, you know, when you have, when you can look at complaints across years, you can see, you know, how did this misconduct happen? And did any of the sanctions actually have a, a, a beneficial result in reducing future risk? Like what could we do to mitigate harm um, as much as possible? And so that that's the idea behind not just collecting data about, you know, what the attorney, the respondents' demographics look like, um, but also, uh, you know, what could also what could be happening in their personal life um, with mental health or substance abuse or uh, financial issues. So that's that's one thing to think about with how to conduct a study and then what interventions might be most helpful. And then and then on the other side um, to think about the complaining witness and, and their experience and while they felt the need to file a complaint in the first place and um, how many times have they done so or has it's new or you know just to get a better sense of the what exactly is happening um, and how to be more informed about how to address it going forward instead of instead of where we've been so far. Uh, so this is what they've done in Australia, which I think it's just an interesting model, and it's been done across different Australian states. Um, I think this one's from Queensland, but it's been done in New South Wales, it's been done in Victoria. But the idea is that the different bars in different states of Australia have said, well, we're going to do this education towards compliance strategy where they've picked like 10 um, issues, areas to be addressed, which do match in many ways some of the allegation codes that OCTC currently uses. And then they um, would like the um, attorneys in those states to fill out um, these brief sort of like, are you compliant, not compliant, partially compliant in these different areas. And what they found in one study, follow-up study in Queensland, um, is that it led to a two-thirds reduction in complaints. And it didn't even so much matter whether the, um, whether the lawyers reported they were compliant or partially compliant or non-compliant. What matters is whether or not they did the self-assessment and they actually reviewed their business practices and their policies, and which you don't always do unless you have a trigger to do so. But it was this very, I just wanted to give you an example of something where it's, a, it's an outreach educational strategy that isn't overly inclusive and could potentially have a very beneficial impact. Um, so this is starting to happen. I know that the, the OPC is looking at this, this issue for California. And I, and I just wanted to kind of leave you with six sort of uh, check boxes or um, areas to think about as you, as you may go down this road. But one thing that made the, um, the checklist self-assessment very favorable in Queensland, Australia specifically, is there was a triggering event. They were required to do it because if they wanted to become an incorporated legal practice versus a traditional firm practice, it was a step they had to make. So they took it pretty seriously. So the idea here is what could be a triggering event? Like, um, and it could it be that a, a complaint came in and it was dismissed, but now this is a way to address what the issue could be, a reportable action bank matter. Um, alternatively, in other states to introduce this type of intervention, such as um, Illinois, um, if, you know, is whether the person's new to practice, they have to go through this type of a self-assessment checklist, or if they choose not to carry malpractice insurance. There are other questions to consider, such as how to easy access, anonymity, um, whether you want to make it count towards continuing legal education, 
um, and then obviously what topics to cover. And that's where the data could help be really informative here. If you could say, well, we know that these are the issues where, you know, this majority of complaints are coming in about client trust issues, then we're going to want to focus our efforts there, which um, is one way to think about how to use the data to make to um, create an intervention. Um, and this is just an example, different states are doing this. This is the one from Illinois, what it could look like. In many ways, it looks like my class. <laughs> so it's just a nice educational online tool. Um, and then very lastly, I just really don't want to I want to encourage that whatever steps are taken, there's always an evaluation approach that set up before the intervention occurs. Um, so, so this is one that we've used risk-based regulation quite a bit, another model to consider, but you know, what's your ultimate um, hazard? Like, what are you trying to avoid? Is it how many juice, um, you know, how many attorneys are disbarred? Um, and then is the benefit going to be a, a decrease in complaints or maybe an increase in complaining witness satisfaction with the process? How much do you want to invest? But whatever it might be, you have an idea for how you're going to evaluate the intervention before you deploy the resources to do so. So I don't, I'm not sure if I went way over my time or not, but I'm, I'm more than happy to um, stop sharing my screen. <laughs> Give me a moment to do that. Uh-oh. Uh, an answer. So, as, as you're seeking to find the stop share screen button, let me um, let me try to serve in my capacity as moderator and and just do a couple of things first in terms of time check. I think you were super efficient. That's great. It's nine fifty, and I did want to mention that our our first scheduled break is not until noon. But I was thinking that we may want to take a break at around ten thirty, um, and I think it might be good. For, I see at least one thumb up, and I, I can't even see all of the windows. So. Let's, uh, let's plan to take a break at uh, around 1030. But I think what this allows us to do also is to move into the two things. One, I'd like to make sure that we hear from anyone who has questions, any of the trustees who would like to, to ask questions of Professor Sklar. And uh, let me see if I can eliminate your share screen because I'm still looking Thank at you. it. Yeah, I mean, my apologies. Yeah. It's usually a hot. Oh, um, I, just, I got it. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. So, um, so before we before we go into um, sort of building on what Professor Sklar just presented, are, are there any questions from trustees? Madam Secretary, before uh, we recognize any trustees, let me welcome Trustee Highland Chen. Good morning, Highland. Welcome back. Morning. Thanks. And then go ahead. Sorry. I I as Professor Sklar was talking, one thing that I wanted to build on a tiny bit was simply this issue of um, categories of complaints and evaluation of the complaints and looking at the, the categories. The, the thing here that we've, we've come to in, in trying to understand how to, to implement something that looks like risk-based regulation is not that the information isn't there. there. There is detailed information on allegations of misconduct but the way that it's currently captured within the system is a slightly wonkish data issue in terms of how the data are captured in the system that prevent us from looking more closely at what exactly is the issue when we look at the data in the aggregate. So it, it, it's the, the challenge that um, Professor Sklar referred to in terms of like looking at forests rather than trees. OCTC, as I think is, is common in all sort of attorney practices, is all about the tree. That's what, that's what every case needs to be about. It needs to be about that case, the individual acts that occurred in any given case. When you conduct research in order to try to use that research for administration, you need to be sort of stepping back and trying to understand it. And that's where we've been working on some issues related to the data to try to recategorize so that we can look at the data in aggregate to see what the specific issues are that are uh, occurring in, in specific cases, and then what the relationship is between different case types and the propensity for um, an attorney being disciplined. So if, if there aren't any further questions right now, and I'm not seeing any hands, nobody's interrupting me, and uh, I've never known you to be a shy group. Um, let's turn it over to, um, I'd like for Lisa Chavez, yeah. director. Yes. I'm sorry. Before you go on, I had my hand up. I apologize. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. You know, I have, I, I have not gotten good at looking at those hands. I'm, 
so I, I do see the blue hand now. Sorry we're about that. Still trying to, we're still trying to indoctrinate ourselves into Zoom 10 months later, so I get it. Um, this is just, first of all, Professor Schuyler, thank you so very much for the level setting conversation. A real simple question. Um, in relation to the qualitative study, what is the ideal time frame for data collection? Oh, that's so interesting. Could I, before I answer that, could I ask you a question in terms of, um, uh, where, I guess it depends on the, so the, the goal of what you're trying to get out of the qualitative study. So we, the, the way we've done it before is we um, really narrowed down to we thought were the most um, severe offenders. Um, and so that, so in that case, it did focus on those who had been disbarred. And then we looked at, and we looked at anything we could get about them, any complaint, any type of um, the, the uh, order, we would try to code it and see um, if there were like common terms that came up. So um, in general, you always, you wanna have a consistent study window and then it's kind of how many respondents fall within it. So in that particular study, it was 2005 to 2015. It was what every attorney who was disbarred during that period. And then those that had, um, you know, uh, 20 or more complaints per respondent was all breakdown. So that, I don't know if that answers your question, but that, that, okay. Thank you. This is, uh, this is Ruben. I'll just make one observation about uh, the tree and the forest analogy. And I like it because I think Dag's right. I think um, Melanie and, and her team uh, must focus on the trees. And we, Donna and we and our team, have to focus on, on the forest, right? And um, I think that the tools that Professor Sklar is talking about in conjunction with the shifts that we're making and have made um, in, our, in our just our simple computer systems uh, might, you know, might dovetail very nicely um, depending on what the direction of the board is. And so I encourage, I encourage all of us to, you know, to be active question askers here. Terrific. Oh, so I, should, that, oh, I, I should also say that um, I am more than happy to share my, my slides, my materials, any of the papers I've written. Um, please, please think of me as a resource. And I'm, I'm really impressed by the dedication you're taking into this area. Thank you, Professor Sklar. Dag, were you going to uh, shift over into the next major topic or the next subtopic of this one? I was, and I think what what uh, what our director of the Office of Research and Institutional Accountability, Lisa Chavez, will be talking about is the work that we've been doing, uh, not only in the Office of Research and Institutional Accountability, but in the Office of Professional Competence, uh, items that are on the State Bar Strategic Plan um, related to uh, proactive regulation, uh, initiatives and issues that already fall into this category of risk-based regulation, even before we had the the sort of umbrella of uh, Professor Sklar's work to place this work under. So uh, Lisa, I'm gonna turn it over to you. So, so actually before Lisa gets started, I just want, want the trustees to um, keep a lot of what Professor Sklar was talking about um, in your minds as we move through the, the rest of the morning, um, because I think there are real discussions to be had about, you know, how, what, what are the best ways to get at that 4%, right? Um, but, um, right, those four percent represent fifty-eight percent of the of the complaints. Um, what about the other the other forty-two percent? What are our obligations to continue to ensure public protection, to allocate our resources effectively, um, and, um, and also um, to really sort of think about you know are there ways by focusing on that four percent that we can we can do things smarter, we can do things better, we can reduce the the impact on our resources. Um, and really focus attention uh, even sort of more clearly on those matters that really uh, impact public protection. So I think there's gonna be a lot that, that as we talk a little bit more this morning, um, that having those thoughts in mind will, will sort of help crystallize some of, some of that discussion. Thank you, Donna. Lisa? Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Lisa Chavez. I'm the director of ARIA. And I'm, um, I'm usually in the Bay Area, but right now I'm in the San Gabriel Valley, my home, um, hometown of Monterey Park, where I'm visiting my father for the week, who's not doing well, but it's still great to visit him. 
And I'm only telling you this because at any moment you might hear my parents' dog barking, which is hilarious. I <laughs> annoys my mother, but I find it hilarious, but you might hear the dog barking. Okay, uh, very pleased to share with you uh, the work we've conducted so far on this topic. Thank you, Professor Fiskalar, for your fantastic presentation. And I'm gonna share my screen and get us started. Let's see. Can everyone see my screen okay? Yes, okay, terrific. So um, the purpose of my presentation is to share with you our current state BART initiatives and issues in reg risk-based regulation. And in particular, I'm gonna talk about the data we've collected so far and how we've made use of it. So as Professor Scholar uh, said, it's really important that all decision-making in an organization uh, is informed by data. And this is kind of like an outline that really guides our work in ARIA and in our partnership with OPC and OCTC. And we think of things like this. If we understand complaining witnesses and the allegations of dismissed complaints, and if we also get a handle on personal and professional characteristics associated with increased risk of receiving a complaint or being disciplined, if we get that information and we understand it and we're confident in it, the state bar then can develop improved targeted educational materials, tools, and programs for attorneys as well as the public. And we can also explore alternative forms of dispute resolution. We engage this work so that we can achieve the following outcomes. Our training practice will improve, the public will be better served and protected, public satisfaction will increase, and there will be disproportionate, and the disproportionate discipline that Professor Farkas documented in his report last year, that too will decrease. So what I'm gonna do for the rest of my presentation is give you an update on the far left part of the slide, uh, the strides we've made with regards to planning our research on complaining witnesses, um, on understanding allegations, and as well as our research on risk. And then I'll also share with you the, uh, some strides we've made in the, for the middle of this slide, in particular, uh, the types of materials that we have improved and decisions we've made to develop new materials and how those activities were driven by a data-informed data -informed, uh, decision. So let's start with our research on understanding the complaining witnesses and the complaint allegations. So I'm gonna here, I'm gonna share so far the research we've done so far on dismissed complaints and the complaining witness survey. So our research on dismissed complaints have shown first and foremost, that the majority of complaints that the state bar closes are dismissed without discipline. And we've taken a look at those allegations that were dismissed in the intake stage. So they didn't even make it to investigation. So 70% of allegations that are dismissed in the intake stage pertain to the following three categories, performance, interference with justice, and duties to clients. The typology we're using is a longstanding one within the state bar. Um, and it, as you can see, it has these big kind of big categories. Performance, for example, is a huge category. So the goal is our next step is to take these categories and break them down into much more granular categories that will inform topics to focus on. And with Professor Scholar's help, we are now analyzing all our allegations according to the following typology. So this, for example, uh, so you can see they're a little bit more detailed. Communication, competence and diligence, compliance, costs, ethical matters, personal conducts, and client trust accounts. So let me give you an example of what that, look, that work looks like. So right now in Odyssey, our case management system, we have nearly 500 allegation codes. And on the left is an example of the allegation codes that are in the database. And as intake workers review complaints, they look at the allegations and categorize them according to one of these uh, allegations. So in the middle, uh, we are, shows our new, new scheme that we're, we're exploring. And on the far right, we are also um, including a subcategory. So for example, the category competence and diligence, so far we have three subcategories. So there's a delay, poor advice handling, and case handling, poor records management. Another category under communication is to be more precise of what we mean by communication is poor or no communication. 
And with regards to cost, there are several subcategories, but here's an example of one, it's called overcharging. So the next step in this work is to understand allegations within cases. So for example, our research has shown that among all dismissed complaints, there are 3.6 allegations per case. So what we're going to explore is how these different categories allegations cluster together. So if a complaint has four, you know, if a, if a complaint, dismissed complaint has three complaints, we're gonna see to what extent all of them are related to communication or not, or which are the top two or three that rise. But in particular, the goal is to just understand to what extent these different allegations cluster together. And then we're also going to understand how these cluster patterns may vary by responding characteristics and particularly the reason for complaint dismissal. So for example, OCTC dismisses complaints for lots of different reasons, one of which is lack of evidence. So if we can uh, understand uh, the relationship between all these factors, we feel it will uh, generate some information that will lead us to uh, make some interesting and really uh, useful policy decisions. So next I'm going to talk to you about the complaining witness survey that Professor Scholar mentioned. Uh, this is a survey that the State Bar sends to all complaining witnesses whose complaints are closed without discipline. Right now we have a 20% response rate. Um, and the goal of this survey is to understand our complaining witnesses, their perceptions of how accessible they found our complaint filing system and the perception of how fair the system is. So here's an example of the questions on the survey that pertain to access. And uh, the respondents, uh, the client with the complaining witnesses are asked whether they disagree or agree on a five point scale with five being the highest that they strongly agree. Here's the example of the questions. Did you find it easy to find the form? Were they clear, the instructions were clear, the website was useful, written instructions were clear. Here's an example of the analyses we've done so far. Uh, what this shows is data for the last three years. And we, when we do analyses on this complaining witness survey, so far we've limit, limited our analysis to understanding complaining witnesses whose cases were dismissed in intake versus those whose, were, whose cases were dismissed in the investigation or the pre-filing stage, because our thinking is, is that these people will experience this, that alone, uh, democration alone will lead to different, likely different perceptions. And what this chart shows is if this is this is actually based on composite of all those access questions is that uh, complaining witnesses whose cases were dismissed further into the process um, had higher ratings of access on the access questions. With regards to fairness, here's an example of some of the questions. Uh, were people given an opportunity to submit additional information? Staff bars treated me with courtesy respect. The state bar explained in a way I was able to understand why they closed my case and the communications uh, addressed the issues raised in my complaint. And here again, uh, you, we do the analysis by when a case was dismissed, the stage it was, and you see that uh, complaining witnesses whose complaints were dismissed later in the process felt that, feel that the process is more fair than those whose cases were dismissed in intake. Lisa, I'm going to I'm going to interject just one comment here uh, to try to uh, to make explicit something that you know we've been discussing cost benefit and how how we prioritize different values that we might have according to um, cost benefit or the associated risks. This this I think gives a good example of where those cases that are dismissed um, at investigation are cases that have had more resources devoted to them. So this is a clear trade-off here in terms of, it's not, it's not that they had more resources devoted to them because we were seeking to improve the per perception of the public or the perception of the complaining witness about the, um, the way that OCTC handles their case. But uh, on the merits of the case, Office of Future Trial Counsel felt that it merited investigation. And so the case went into investigation and more time was spent on it. It took longer to process. It took more staff resources to process. Simply that additional case handling appears to result in greater satisfaction on the part of the complaining witness with regard to the state bar's handling of their complaint against an attorney. That's, that, that's a, an implicit trade-off. And I just wanted to make that implicit trade-off explicit in terms of what that means then in terms of our resources. It's, it's certainly less resource intensive 
to um, assess a case at intake and say, you know what, there's nothing here. And if there is nothing there, when it gets complained, when it gets closed at intake uh, on the merits, it results in lower level of satisfaction for the complaint witness. So um, I just wanted to make that point explicit. Thank you, Dad. Okay, so uh, these charts that I've shared with you um, are pretty much the extent of the analysis we've done with this rich data set so far. However, our goal this year is to conduct additional analyses. So some analyses we're uh, planning are, for example, to link survey responses to the original complaints to understand the allegations, area of law, and the reason for its dismissal. Um, we also are in an opportunity to explore survey results by race, gender, and income because we do ask for these optional reporting data fields in the survey. And then also um, the survey has a, a few open-ended questions that we will uh, explore the answers to. So one example, is there anything else the state bar should know about your experience with how your complaint was handled? And so this is research we're going to explore further with the complaining witness survey. Okay, so next I'm going to um, share update, give you an update on the on our efforts to understand predictors of risk and for complaints and discipline. And in particular, I'm going to talk about our data collection efforts and one project in particular, which seeks to identify the transitions to high risk employment sectors. Lisa, uh, I apologize for interrupting. Sure. This is Ruben. Yeah. Um, it looks like you're going to go on to a new sort of a new major topic. I have a question about the last set of slides that you presented and it actually okay. related to one of the first slides where I believe the statistic was 70% um, of complaints are dismissed. And one of the factors was performance. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just wanna be sure I understand that um, completely. There you go. Um, when you say performance, that means the performance of the attorney who's being complained against that essentially at intake, we made a determination that there was nothing wrong with the way they did their job in relation to the complaint? I, cases are dismissed for lots of reasons. I, and I would, I would say that that's a question that would be better handled by OCTC. We have had exactly, I think, this conversation in terms of saying, hey, wow, you know, there was nothing there. And I think the OCTC, I would encourage Melanie or Steve to jump in here. I don't think that that's um, the conclusion you can draw from that. Yeah, I, I don't think it necessarily means that there wasn't anything wrong, but one of the big things that we're looking at at the intake level is um, looking at the four corners of the complaint. If everything were true, would it actually amount to an ethical violation? And a lot of times the answer is no. Um, and on that basis, uh, the complaint is then closed at the intake level. So, so when you close the complaint, is there a letter or something that goes to the complaining witness that explains your decision? Yes. Um, complaining witnesses always get uh, letters to explain no matter what uh, stage the complaint is actually closed on. Now the respondent um, at the intake level does not get any kind of notification or, uh, or letter. So it's very likely that they never know that there was a complaint filed. And I'm going to um, take advantage of the tools that we have available to us. I noted that uh, trustee Tony raised a hand. So, uh, Trustee Tony, and I see uh, next Trustee Sowell. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, I wanted to follow up with, uh, with Ms. Lawrence. Could you please um, explain to me what the rationale is for not notifying the attorneys who had a complaint? I'm sure there's a rationale. But, um, you know, and, and I know that Professor Sklar had said that that might be something to be considered, but I want to start from understanding why we have the practice we do right now. Sure. Um, so one thing, first of all, the one place in the intake uh, unit where we do notify the respondent attorney is when we're talking about these RA bank matters, uh, because we're reaching out to the respondent attorney to ask um, what the reason is for the NSF activity. Um, but when it comes to the rest of them, we have an obligation to notify the complaining witness, um, and that's by rule. We don't similarly have a, uh, an obligation to notify the respondent. Um, so, so one of the reasons is just complying with our obligation. 
Um, I think practically speaking, one of the other real challenges to, to doing um, some notifications for respondents, if we were to do them in every case, is just the volume, um, because the intake unit is where we see the largest number of complaints. Um, and I think it would be really challenge, challenging to manage the volume of that if we were to add that, at least under our current structure. Thank you. The, the next sit hand that I saw raised was uh, Trustee Sowell, and after that, uh, Trustee Delenn. Just real quick, I, um, I noted that there were 500 uh, allegation codes. Mm -hmm. And I think the thing that struck me about that number was, um, uh, does that in some way invite folks to, um, uh, you know, to file a, a complaint in, in some sort? Because there are, there, there's just so many uh, opportunities to do so, I guess. I, I'm just sort of wondering if that is, if that's a, a leading sort of indicator in some fashion. And then second is, um, I may have missed this, but in terms of the, uh, the surveys, um, uh, I, just, I, I don't know if I heard how those are going out or how they do go out. Is that, does everybody get one that, that, uh, uh, that files a complaint or, or, or how that's done? I was just interested in, in hearing a little bit more about that. Maybe, maybe, Lisa, if you would start with the, uh, the distribution of surveys issue, and then OCTC, I think, would be best uh, positioned to discuss the, the number of allegation categories and whether that creates perverse incentives of some kind. Great. Um, so the complaining witness survey, um, uh, all complaining witnesses whose cases are dismissed without discipline are invited to participate in the survey, and we contact them through, uh, through email. And it's an online survey. On the topic of allegation codes, um, I think the answer is no, and I say that because um, the allegation codes are really only for our purposes. Um, it's not something that the complaining witness is aware of at all. So um, when a complaint comes in, we are then using our allegation codes to actually code what uh, potential violations might exist. Got it. I appreciate, uh, uh, appreciate that. Um, Lisa, on the survey, um, uh, do we get pretty good results in terms of uh, responding? Yeah, so we have a 20% uh, response rate. We're always looking to improve that. But we're happy with that. I mean, so far, I mean, the fact that anyone replies at all stress or rematch is, you know, we, we are happy with, you know, the responses that we do get, but of course we're always looking to improve. I can uh, add to that a little bit. It's quite it's quite remarkable and innovative that um, Araya is engaged in this work right now. Uh, we proposed something similar in Australia, which is um, was which was not as receptively received. <laughs> so I think it's just it's just a really nice step and to get feedback directly from the complaining witness um, and get their perspective on the, why they came forward, the whole that, the process of the complaint um, in general. I, I just think it's a really valuable input that I, I haven't actually seen any other legal regulator take part in. I, I just give a, a global perspective there. Thank you. I think uh, Sonia had a question next. Um, yes, I do. Thank you. <clears throat> of those that were uh, dismissed without any, uh, the, the, and, and now that I know that the respondents are not being informed, how many of those, are or rather the occurrence of repeat complaints for the same respondent, you know, since, because if, if the respondents are not being informed of that there had been a complaint, um, it, it, could, it could be an education for them to make sure that it doesn't ever happen or if there's border, if it's borderline to at least to get them, you know, it, aware that that can lead into something that will be more you know serious than being dismissed and without any information or anything that any uh, idea that they are already borderline in committing uh, infraction or discipline so sonia it's 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 uh it's good that that you it's interesting that you picked up on that um that um that 
um, another trustee made, sort of made a similar comment about the surprise that folks aren't um, uh, contacted at this stage, right? And it may not be that it's sort of borderline. It may be that there's, you know, th that there is th that there is nothing in the in the the conduct that rises to the level of of misconduct. Um, but there is this question that we have got on the table for uh, later that we were planning to to talk about sort of the possibility of should we be um, sending uh, at, at some point sending sending letters to the respondents in these in these cases? Is it when they've gotten one? Is it when they've gotten five? Um, just to let them know that the, you know there's this level of performance that doesn't rise to the level of misconduct. But you 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 might want to know that you know we've gotten complaints about this from ten clients, so they can sort of use that information. Maybe it didn't occur to them that the behavior that they were engaging in was troublesome to the client. It's not misconduct, but um, it may be, you know, a, a helpful plan for them to think about what to do differently in the future. And so that is, um, that was one of the, the possibilities that we were going to be talking about. I, I, I would like to add to that a, a further complicating factor. I think that this issue of communication with, with um, respondents is a really important and interesting one. And, you know, something we were discussing just the other day was cases in which respondents, attorneys engage in offensive behavior. Perhaps they engage in offensive behavior publicly. And, and members of the public look at that behavior and say, complain to the state bar. When we get numerous complaints about a single respondent about behavior that's clearly offensive, it's morally reprehensible, and yet it's not disciplinable conduct. And so um, here we're, we're into an even, I think, dicier area with regard to if somebody's engaging, uh, making, taking advantage of their First Amendment uh, rights to engage in offensive speech, um, and the state bar gets complaints about that person, it certainly reflects poorly on the profession. Um, it certainly uh, is suggestive of moral character issues related to attorney conduct, but it's not disciplinable. It's, it, it is protected speech. And so the state bar finds itself in, I think, a, a, a difficult position when we see um, issues like that. I, so in, by way of doing some timekeeping here, I think we're, we're very well poised to conclude, uh, to let Lisa conclude her section if there are no more questions related to this topic um, that she just concluded. So if she could finish her, her section, we'll be in a good position to take a little break, maybe five minutes to around 10.30, uh, depending upon when Lisa finishes, and then we'll, we'll, get, we'll, we'll ramp back up following that and um, turn it over to the Office of Chief Trial Counsel and the State Bar Court. Great, thank you, Doug. Okay, so we're now gonna share uh, the data collection efforts we've engaged in um, with regards to identifying uh, what, risk, uh, what puts attorneys at risk for complaints and discipline. So what's guiding our research is exactly that. What predicts receiving a complaint and or being disciplined? <clears throat> And we've identified the following risk factors based on research, based on Professor Scholar's research, uh, it's personal characteristics, things like race, age, years of practice and location. And we actually have this data available for our respondents. Um, data on case characteristics will also be useful, including relationship to attorneys, uh, allegations and specific area of law for the case, not necessarily the area of law that an attorney claims to practice, but in particular, what was the specific topic area for the case? And personal and professional stressors, uh, as Professor Sklar mentioned, uh, financial, health, and relationships. What I'm going to talk to you about is our efforts to collect data that, among all these risk factors that we do not have readily available in our electronic databases. That is in Odyssey, our case management system that's collected on a regular basis for all the complaints that we have coming in. And in particular, um, we don't have data on specific area of law for the specific cases, and we don't have data in our databases on personal and professional stressors. So what I'm gonna share with you are efforts to collect that information. So we did an in-depth analysis of 100 case narratives <clears throat> uh, this year and in 2020, and we that revealed that the following information is really easy to, to, easy to discern in, in most cases that, we, that come in to the State Bar. In particular, it's the complaint specific area of law. So, for example, it's specific family law area, whether it's divorce, 
custody, et cetera, personal injury, a landlord dispute. That level of detail is in um, these in the narratives and the client's complaints. And so we are working with OCTC to first and foremost come up with a system of categorization that intake uh, workers can, intake employees can then categorize and add to Odyssey, which will lend itself to analyses. And with this data, we're going to be in a position to identify the highest risk areas of law uh, that will inform very specific and targeted educational materials and tools. With regards to data on personal stressors and other risk factors, um, our conclusion is, is the best way to get this is, is just to replicate Professor Scholar's study. Uh, so our plan is to review case files um, and in particular make use of like the real volume of research of, of information that is avail available for cases that make all the way up to discipline. There's the initial complaints, but there's also narratives from investigators, um, all sorts of just materials and a rich variety of materials available. And so when we take a look at, uh, we're gonna identify a set of cases, perhaps for example, we'll focus on a set of cases that resulted in disbarment. Um, we're gonna explore personal stressors, uh, relationship with clients, uh, many professional isolation issues that may be going on, and whether or not perhaps there's a lot of people out there who are quote unquote ill-equipped generalists, as Professor Sklar calls them, whose efforts to be like a Jack and Jill of all trades are leading to difficulties. Okay, so that's our plan moving forward with regards to data collection. But right now I wanna share with you um, a project that we um, are going to engage in that is really driven by data. Uh, so for example, um, in data collection, um, we know that solo practitioners are at risk of higher, are higher risk for discipline. Professor Farkas found that in his research on uh, disproportionate discipline. So actually, he confirmed something that kind of, we all sort of knew anecdotally, and OCTC has often mentioned anecdotally. So the goal is to identify attorneys who transition from medium large so law firms to solo practice and proactively offer services. So if you can imagine an attorney who works in a medium large law firm, they're there, they have support, you know, as they engage with clients, any conflicts, et cetera. Uh, once, if they move to solo practice, suddenly they're on their own and may not have a support. And therefore, um, we really feel this is a really great opportunity to reach out to people and practically offer resources. Uh, the Board of Trustees approved the mandatory licensee reporting of employment sector and law firm size uh, last year. And we are rolling that out, that data collection in spring of this year. And what this is going to involve is adding these two data fields to the MyStapler profile um, where attorneys report their employer and address. And so um, we'll have this information starting in spring. So the next steps then is to develop an automated process to flag when attorneys report a change in sector and law firm size. And so uh, my understanding is that our licensees are required to report changes in employment within three months, I think it is, of making that change. And so this should be happening throughout the year as people make changes. It wouldn't just be limited, say, during the fee billing period. Um, so we're going to develop an automated process to flag for staff when that happens. And then we're also going to research the most common transitions. So right now we're, we're working with the idea that we're gonna first focus on this, the attorneys that transition from law firm, uh, medium to large law firm to solo practitioners. However, our research may show that there's other more common, even more common transitions and uh, develop targeted resource materials for them. So before I move on to describe our most recent work in proactive regulation, does anyone have any questions about these two uh, activities I just described? It doesn't look like it. Okay. I, All right. I, I do. Sure. I'm sorry. My hand must not be visible. I, I've got to fix that. I have a question. Are there other factors that will be taken into account, particularly, particularly race and ethnicity? Um, for you mean for the research in general or for this particular project about for this particular project? Um, I think if the research shows it, yes. I mean, if there's an interaction effect between race and and common transitions, I I would say 
that's something we can definitely consider. Well, and that was that was my that was my question kind of initially in terms of are there other factors that will be taken into account in terms of as people make the transition, are there other characteristics that you'll be asking for? And then and then, you know, particularly race and ethnicity. I believe the goal will be to make use of all data available to us on our respondents, on our attorney population. So is that information collected? Do you already have that data? On race and ethnicity of our, of our attorney li our licensee population? Yes. In terms of people, okay. So in terms of people who are making that transition, you already have that information. On our license, yeah. So this information is going to be for all licensees, regardless of whether they have been disciplined or not. Perfect, thank you. And, and, and Melanie, the um, race ethnicity data is um, voluntarily self-reported. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have we have the data um, for some and not for others. And I just, I just pose that question and don't mean to belabor time. I just pose that question as I think through the prism of the diversity study. Um, and so wondering how the two intersect. Yes. Thank and you. I, I think what you've touched on uh, Trustee Shelby is that we do have uh, a lot of overlap between the different components of the work that we're doing. So uh, issues that we uncovered in looking at disproportionate discipline, which drew upon data and I, I'm gonna make a slight modification to what Donna said drew actually upon our admissions data. So we, we didn't previously connect, collect race ethnicity data, but we were able to merge data that's collected from people when they apply to become a member of the bar. And we were able to merge that data over. So the discipline system data in and of itself didn't, and still actually still doesn't have race ethnicity data. It's in a separate place where we merge it in. So as a, as a practical matter, we are increasingly getting self-reported data and seeking to, uh, to create better categories of, uh, of demographics on our attorney population. But it's a, it's a great question insofar as uh, some of what we've been doing in response to trying to address the disproportionate discipline issue ultimately um, is more of a proactive and supportive approach for the attorney population more consistent with risk-based regulation, not because that's where we were headed, but just because that's what made sense. Okay, thank you for that. Great. Dad, can Professor I- Professor uh, Sklar, um, and uh, I'm sorry, uh, Chair Duran, I, Vice Chair Duran, I, Professor Sklar had a hand up and I was just, just gonna recognize her real quickly if I may. Well, I just, I, am, I just wanted to vote on Trustee Shelby's comment about other factors related to this um, current project that, that Lisa outlined. Because another factor that comes up too is, is age. Um, and one trend we've seen uh, very pronounced with physicians as they retire is they're continuing to prescribe medications, for example, even though that they're working less and less hours as they're staging into retirement. And that can be a trend for lawyers as well as those you know, slowly scale off in their practices, especially, and you're, you're catch them, right? Because they'll probably go from working in firms to maybe doing some solo work, working 40, 30, 20 hours. But as you do so, you know, you may become less aware of, you know, current regulations or practices. And so that's another flag that I think we can be really supportive on for older attorneys as they um, stage into retirement. One more, one more tip to add to your list there. And Dag, I just wanted to point out um, as an offshoot of Melanie's question and comment, uh, licensees are given the opportunity to self-report demographic data um, every year that we renew our, license, renew, our, uh, renew our license and pay our fees. So if there's a change in you know, something, <laughs> we can report it. Yes. All right, so I'll pick, let me just go ahead and finish off. Thank you for your questions and your comments. So now I'm gonna conclude by sharing the recent work that we've done in proactive regulation. Um, I'm going to describe our work with the attorney self-assessment program. And then I'm going to briefly just review our work on reportable action bank letters and attorney representation. The latter two flowed from our research on the disproportionate discipline. So DAG, uh, and we engaged in it was, these are projects where we analyze data and came up with solutions based on the analyses that we see. And um, even though we didn't call it risk-based regulation or proactive regulation at the time, that's essentially what it was, except it was for the purpose of uh, reducing disproportionate discipline. So let me just quickly um, go through these. So the self-assessment, um, attorney self-assessment program 
and it's going to be developed by the Office of Professional Competence. The trustees authorized this program's adoption in July 2020 per, per the strategic plan. And ultimately what the self-assessment program is, is described as Professor Scalar, uh, the purpose is for attorneys to conduct self-assessments for the purpose of improving their practice. And the goal is to create an interactive e-learning tool on a variety of topics, starting with client trust accounting. Uh, this project has been initiated and Professor Scholar will consult with us on it. Um, and just as a reminder, risk, the risk research that we'll be doing this year on the highest predictors of research will, will inform the topics moving forward. I just wanted to remind everyone about the reportable action bank matters. Um, the research showed that attorney African, African American male attorneys were more at risk um, in the sense that they were more likely to receive a reportable action bank matter. Uh, the state bar researched the impact of raising the de minimis threshold, but we, we recommended no change. And in turn, the trustees directed staff to explore proactive preventative approach to reportable action bank matters for the purpose of reducing uh, disproportional discipline in this matter. And so the action that OCTC took was that they revised the RA bank matter letters that they shared out. In particular, they changed the response protocol. Once upon a time, they only they sent like four letters um, and only the resource letter, which about 40 people a year received, contained lots of re re uh, resources on client trust accounting issues. Now they've added those resources to all, um, a, all uh, letters that they send out and on an annual basis moving forward, over 800 attorneys will receive these resources. In addition, they modified and enhanced the resources, they improved the resources descriptions, added new resources, added new warning language, and including information about the Lawyers Assistance Book Program. So our uh, next steps from this work is to analyze to what, so these, the letter that attorneys receive have all these live links to these resources. And our next step is to first and foremost, to see to what extent people are clicking on the links uh, this will tell us to what extent um, which resources are resonating more than others, and that could possibly uh, lead to making changes um, in the language to um, make them more interesting to people to be motivated to click on. And eventually we will, of course, explore the impact of this. So if all goes well, uh, there, we should see fewer reportable action bank matters for people. And I'm going to put a slightly finer point on this just to, to refer it back to the comment that Trustee Delen made about communication with clients. So there was a, a, a question about, well, on, on most cases that are closed, in particular didn't take, there's no communication with the, uh, the respondent attorney. In the reportable action bank matters, there is communication, a closing letter on, uh, and after we find that there has been no issue, that there, there some communication with the client. But this is uh, an enhancement of that closing letter. It, instead of simply saying, we're closing your case and we determined that there was nothing there. It said, it's, we're closing your case, we've determined that there's nothing there, but, and then ensuring that that list of resources, uh, uh, materials that have been developed by our Office of Professional Competence, um, uh, other information that would be useful for preventing misconduct in the future or preventing a, an oversight from becoming misconduct, um, is provided to the respondent attorney. So I just wanted to make that point. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Okay, and uh, last I'm going to share a uh, work we've done with regards to attorney representation. Professor Farkas' research showed, uh, identified another risk, and that is that attorney representation explores, explains a significant share of disproportionate discipline between black and white male attorneys. So Professor Robertson, who examined Professor uh, Farkas's research and set a recommend, set, uh, identified a set of recommendations for OCTC and the State Bar to engage in, he recommended that the State Bar educate attorneys on the an importance of securing representation. And he also recommended that the State Bar engage the Association of Discipline Defense Council regarding offering attorneys pro bono services. So the action OCTC took in collaboration uh, with ARIA and other uh, parts of the state bar is to develop a personalized letter with a link to the ADDC. So here's the letter on the right. And whenever attorney, the attorneys whose cases are moved to investigation are contacted by the state bar. Um, and this letter here is personalized and attached to that letter. And here, here's, here's, um, here it is. Um, this, this was a real labor of love. Um, we consulted with Professor 
uh, Robertson on this research. I mean, on this letter, he is an expert, not only being a law professor, he's also an expert in a language and how to think about how to present language and how to frame things in order to increase an outcome. And in this, our case, the, the goal is for our attorney, our respondents to read this letter, be convinced by it, click on the link, etc. Um, so the next steps for the, our work here is to analyze to what extent people are actually clicking on that link. Um, and then of course, we want to analyze any impact this has on representation. If all goes well, we should see a higher share, higher shares of attorneys securing representation as they face discipline. Um, we're also going to pilot test alternative language as needed, and we will. We have already started to engage ADC, ADDC on pro bono services, and we will continue that work. Okay, that's all I have for now. Um, I can take any questions. Thank you, Lisa. Any questions, colleagues, for for Lisa or Dag or Professor Sklar, while we still have her? Okay, looks like not. Um, I think Dag's suggestion for a break at 1030 was a good one 10 minutes ago. Um, 10 minutes for a break. So we would reconvene at uh, 1050. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? All right, we'll see you back here in 10. Thanks. I was calling Sarah. You're welcome, Vice Chair. <laughs> I, was calling, I was calling Sarah the clerk earlier and I, I was mistaken in that, so I apologize. It is, I believe, uh, 1050. So um, it looks like we are close to having a quorum back with us if the secretary would so confirm. Um, as soon as she does that, we will get rolling with what's next on the agenda, Donna and or Dag. You have a quorum. Great, thank you. So um, this is a great discussion and I, I, I appreciate everyone's input and, and comments. And I, I hope we can continue uh, in that same spirit and um, get some input. We're gonna, we're gonna move next to something uh, that was implemented in the Office of Chief Trial Counsel uh, about three years ago now. Um, and even before we were using any language of risk-based regulation or thinking about it in these terms, uh, our then new, um, Chief Trial Counsel Stephen Moad uh, came in and looked at the cases and looked into finding out how best to prioritize the cases to ensure that those cases that appeared to have the greatest risk for harm to the public um, could be prioritized in the Office of Chief Trial Counsel. Um, our interim Chief Trial Counsel Melanie Lawrence, our special assistant to the Chief Trial Counsel Stephen Moad, will be discussing this and talking about some of the details and. Um, uh, sharing that information with you. And then the issue of prioritization invariably raises a question of um, what's deprioritized. Um, if everything's prioritized, obviously nothing is. And so uh, the converse of that is that when you prioritize, you're also saying that certain cases are less important. And it raises questions about the discretion that OCTC enjoys with regard to deprioritizing certain cases. And, and how that's different, as I indicated at the outset in my introductory statement, how that's different from say a, a district attorney's office in terms of saying, you know what, these are not the cases we're gonna focus on. Um, it's, it's a challenge for the Office of Chief Trial Counsel that um, uh, our Chief Trial Counsel, Melanie Lawrence is going to speak to. And then this question of prioritization extending beyond the Office of Chief Trial Counsel, but also possibly reaching into the state bar court, which does not share a case prioritization scheme has its own rules for um, handling of cases and for timelines for when cases are can't handled and how they're handled. So we're going to bring in then Michelle Crampton, the clerk of the State Bar Court, and Rebecca Rosenberg, uh, court counsel for the State Bar Court. So um, with that, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Melanie Lawrence and Stephen Mollad. Thank you and good morning. Um, this is a really exciting discussion, and I say that because it is really time to think about our work differently um, and to better protect the public as a result of doing so. And I say that because for many, many years, we have done our work the same way year end, uh, year, year after year. Um, and so this idea of focusing on the forest and making some decisions about forest management 
really will help OCTC to better focus on the trees because perhaps there will be less of them. That's what you hope for. Um, but I want to give you sort of a brief history of time uh, before we really begin to talk about case prioritization, sort of so that you know where we've been um, and what we've been working to do in terms of changing uh, some things in the office. Um, and I know for those of you who have been on the board for a couple of years, you've heard some of this before, but I recognize that there are new folks on the board. And also I'm mindful of the fact that um, this discussion will help inform the, the work of the ad hoc commission where, and I'm certain that this topic will be one of those uh, topics. Um, and that is our office uh, for many, many years has been singularly focused on one thing, and that is something called backlog. Um, and the reason for that is because there is a statute um, it's worded sort of aspirationally um, that it shall be the goal and the policy of the state bar to resolve all complaints within 180 days. Um, and that's 180 days from start to finish. And so when I say that, I mean 180 days to intake a case, to investigate a case, to move a case that's going to move into pre-filing and to do the work in pre-filing, which includes uh, a pre-filing settlement conference if the respondent chooses one, and then to actually file the case. And that is very different than a district attorney's office, for example, because in a district attorney's office, the cases that a district attorney gets in large part have already been worked up by a law enforcement agency and then passed to the district attorney's office to actually prosecute. So while we are prosecutors, we are also the intake of complaints and the investigators of complaints. Um, and the backlog and how it is reported and, and um, shared out um, is focused on one day of the year, and that's December 31st. What the backlog number is on December 31st has been how our office has been judged for years. And the reason for that is the bar every year reports to the legislature in something called an annual discipline report about the health of the disciplinary system. And one of those uh, marks um, is what that backlog number is on December 31st. And you can imagine what this does in terms of how you actually manage an inventory. Um, and by that, I mean that having a singular focus on one number on one date has the effect on a staff of working in a very cyclical fashion. And that's exactly what's happened. So for example, as of July 1st of every year, the office knows all of the potential cases that could be 180 days or older by December 31st. And so what happens is that work be has begun in earnest on December on July 1st, looking towards that December 31st date. Now, it's not to say that work wasn't being done before, but there begins a pressure that begins building as of July 1st, and it continually gets uh, greater as the year goes on. Um, it's very unhealthy for the staff, as you can imagine. Um, and it's very unhealthy for public protection because it means that you're not evenly managing the inventory over the year. You're working in earnest so hard at the end of the year and then in January, everybody is exhaling and you're doing that for a couple of months before you ramp up again. And again, it's simply not a healthy way to work. Um, but the reason for it, like I said, is the statute and the reporting and the fact that there's been significant criticism um, of our office for many years over that singular number. Um, and it has really had a negative impact on the office and perpetuated the way the office has worked. Um, so just to give you one example, in 2011, the then executive executive director came in and said to our office, you will zero out the backlog. By December 31st, there will be no cases in backlog. Well, 
the challenge with that is you, you don't have any additional resources and you have the same amount of complaints. And so if you want to actually reach that goal, you know that you're not going to be able to give 100% to every single case in the inventory. You're going to have to find a way to resolve all those cases in some way to move them out of the inventory. And probably the ways that you're doing that are not necessarily consistent with public protection. And in fact, that's exactly what happened. So December 31st comes, the backlog number is it's not zero, but it's pretty close to zero. Um, and then what happened in 2012, um, there were a number of stipulations, stipulations which are um, basically settlement agreements that we enter into with respondents um, to actually settle cases. Those have to, for the, in large part, go to the California Supreme Court to actually sign off on to order the discipline. Well, in 2012, the California Supreme Court sent a number of those settlement agreements back to our office. They had all been the product of trying to zero out the backlog because the Supreme Court was concerned that we had settled cases inconsistent with public protection and inconsistent with the standards uh, that guide dis uh, disciplinary violations. Um, so we have I've been looking in the last couple of years, and Deg um, touched on this, at ways that we can manage the inventory more effectively and doing it more consistently throughout the year. And we recognize that the concept of backlog, or at least aged cases, is one measure of the discipline system. It is something to be mindful of. And it's always going to exist when you have more cases coming in then you have people to manage the cases. So what we've tried to do is instead of only working cases that are the oldest cases first, regardless of the fact that tomorrow a case comes in that has a greater risk to the public, instead when we're looking at those aged cases, we're trying to be mindful of what kind of cases are actually in that backlog or aged inventory such that they're not the kind of cases that are posing the most significant public protection risk. So I wanna turn it over to Steve, who's gonna talk a little bit about how this has been conceptualized and how it's been working in our office. So Steve. So before, before you go, Steve, I just wanted to, uh, as Dag likes to say, put a finer point on, on that. Sure. Um, so uh, backlog is a proxy for, um, for ensuring that we are processing our cases uh, uh, as efficiently as possible, that we are not letting cases languish, um, and that we are not therefore harming pu harming public protection. Um, it's right. Nobody's saying that we shouldn't have um, uh, standards in order to ensure that we are moving the cases effectively. The the issue, and I think um, if you look at the past couple of um, annual discipline reports that the state bar has published, we put these publish these in a, the end of April every year. Um, what we have talked about is that, as Melanie said, backlog is one measure um, of how well we are doing to protect the public. Um, but we don't believe it's it's the best measure to determine how well we are doing to protect the public because it is um, it is not focusing on those cases, how are we doing on those cases that do in fact have the most impact on public protection, that, can, that are causing the, the most public harm. Um, and so that's what we've been striving to do, really focus on um, not sort of pure day in, day out, what, what meets the 180 calendar days, but really trying to uh, redefine um, instead of having this proxy of backlog, um, redefine how you determine the health of the organization, how you determine the effectiveness of the organization to protect the public in lieu of using this proxy. So with that, Steve. Thank you. Uh, good morning and happy new year. Uh, it's good to see you all again. Uh, I am going to talk to you about uh, case prioritization. As uh, Melanie and Donna have both said, uh, that I think that we can think of backlog as uh, there is some correlation between backlog and public protection. Uh, and unfortunately, it has been really the sole focus uh, of 
our stakeholders uh, and the way that the state bar has been judged for more than 30 years. And so we have tried to look for something that is more highly correlated to public protection than the backlog number. And so we do have developed uh, the case prioritization system. And so I wanna start with sort of what case prioritization is and what it is not. And case prioritization is not a backlog reduction tool, right? It's not designed to reduce the backlog. It is uh, designed, uh, it is a recognition that with finite resources, we must prioritize our cases to ensure that we are focusing on those cases wherein the attorney poses the most significant risk to the public. Case prioritization is also a recognition that not every case is the same and we should treat them differently. And to borrow an analogy from criminal prosecution, we've heard why uh, in some ways we are like criminal prosecution and in some ways we are not. But to, again, to borrow an analogy from that, a petty theft is not the same as a homicide. And case prioritization is a recognition that we should focus our, our limited resources on high priority cases to a greater extent than lower priority matters. It's also important to note that by placing a priority on one thing, as Dag has already mentioned, we necessarily reduce the priority of other things. For example, if a priority system is not based entirely on the age of a complaint, the emphasis on minimizing the number of matters in backlog or the aged inventory is also necess necessarily reduced. The important questions uh, under case prioritization are not solely what is the number of cases in backlog, it is what is the mixture of priority cases in backlog and are the cases in backlog, meaning those that sit for a longer period of time, the cases involving attorneys who represent the least threat to the public. And if that is true, then that shows an indication that we're doing the right thing. Finally, as I mentioned to the board in early 2018, the case prioritization criteria must be sufficiently flexible to address trends in attorney misconduct and be susceptible to quick revision as operational needs require. Therefore, OCTC sought and received approval of the concept of a case prioritization system that applies different processes to different case priorities. At OCTC's request, the board did not adopt specific case prioritization criteria. That said, the, the prioritization criteria that we use today are the same example criteria provided to the board in 2018 uh, and again to you for this meeting. So why does case prioritization matter? Well, it matters because a backlog of non-prioritized cases, meaning low risk to the public, isn't necessarily an indication of uh, the, the system, the, the disciplinary system health is poor or that the state bar's ability to protect the public is, is uh, poor. Assuming we are prioritizing the right cases, a backlog of non-prioritized cases is more a commentary on our resources than anything else. Remember, backlog in and of itself doesn't say anything about the cases themselves. One case is one case. Uh, they're all counted the same. So how does case prioritization work? Well, we have divided the cases up into three, really four uh, different categories at this point. We have priority. Would you like me to share the slide on this? Also, I wanted to point out to the trustees as well as to anybody from the public who's attending. There is a more detailed document related to case prioritization, which is available on the State Bar's website. Um, it's listed under the meeting um, where the meetings are upcoming meetings are listed as a, a link to OCTC case prioritization. That document was distributed to trustees last night. Um, so that's the, uh, I would refer you to the detail, but then Steve, the uh, slide, would you like me to just display it? I, I think it's okay, Doug. Thank you. Okay. All right. So we've divided up the inventory into uh, three main categories with one that we added on later. They are divided up into priority one or what we ref commonly refer to as P1 matters. And this category includes those cases that prevent significant, ongoing or serious potential harm to the public. And cases are designated as P1 where they involve vulnerable victims, including immigrants, seniors, or inmates. Uh, they, are, they are cases of client abandonment, abusive or frivolous litigants, 
and attorneys engaging in or aiding and abetting the unauthorized practice of law. And OCTC places emphasis on investigating and prosecuting these cases. We also have priority two, or what we sometimes refer to as expedited matters. And this applies to those matters that either can be easily resolved or require rapid investigation to determine if more significant harm is occurring or will occur. And to prevent the unnecessary consumption of resources, we do not require that the full panoply of investigative steps that are required in other matters apply to these matters. Some expedited cases may be resolved, for example, with a very focused effort by uh, obtaining a, a specific document or interviewing a specific witness without conducting an exhaustive inquiry of the entire matter. Uh, the expedited process is intended to protect our limited investigative and attorney resources, thereby allowing OCTC to dedicate resources to priority one and standard matters. The next category is just that, priority three, or what we sometimes call standard matters. This is really a catch-all for cases that do not fall into either of the other two categories. And priority three cases are expected to, to constitute the bulk of OCTC's statutory backlog. Uh, that was the way that the system was designed, and that's the way that we have seen things bore out. Uh, the last category, which was sort of an add-on, was priority four matters. And, and that is something that we have used to designate matters that would qualify for expediting, but with, for which we did not have sufficient resources. And it was a way for us to track uh, how many more cases we could expedite if we had additional resources. Uh, we don't currently have very many of these because uh, during the pandemic, uh, the matters that qualify for expedited treatment, the, uh, the number of complaints we've received in those types of matters has reduced, uh, has been reduced. So uh, we are not overwhelming our expediter resources at this point, although we were early on. <clears throat> so how is case prioritization working for us? And this is still uh, relatively new when we're considering we did it one way for more than 30 years and we've had you know, two plus almost three years uh, of case prioritization. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, when case prioritization was initially conceived, we targeted including only five to 10% of our inventory as P1s because we were concerned that by prioritiz prioritizing too many of our cases, we would in fact be not prioritizing anything. In reality, as implemented, the P1s made up approximately 21% of our inventory initially, and this has decreased slightly over time, but it's still significantly more than we were intending. So how do we measure success under the case prioritization system? Uh, again, it can't just be tied to the number of cases in backlog. Well, ORIA reports a metric of the P1 percentage of total backlog to the board each month. In May of 2018, which was after adoption by the board of the case prioritization system, but before implementation of that case prioritization system, the metric showed that 40% of the backlog was attributable to P1 cases. Almost half, 40%, four out of 10, were high priority cases that would presented the most risk to the public. In May of 2019, a year later, that number had been reduced to 26%. In May of 2020, that number had been reduced to 18.4%. And in December of 2020, that metric showed that only 16.5% of the backlog is attributable to P1 cases. Of course, this makes sense because if you prior prioritize only age, more high, pro high priority cases would fall into the backlog. Uh, we are pleased that we have steadily decreased the number of P1 cases in backlog since the system has been put in place. As mentioned, uh, prioritizing one uh, thing means deprioritizing something else. And we have seen an increase in the overall backlog, but those are primarily attributable to our lower priority cases. And there are a number of reasons for that. And certainly uh, de-emphasizing the number of cases in backlog and instead emphasizing the types of cases in backlog has had an impact on that. There are a number of other factors that we could talk about as well, but for purposes of today, we'll just leave it at that. 
Uh, we have focused on ensuring that stakeholders know, and uh, even after almost three years, we still sometimes have to remind ourselves that it is not the overall backlog number that is the most important factor. Making sure that cases in backlog represent the least threat to the public is the most important thing. And sometimes there's a little gut check every time you see that backlog number is, oh goodness, and then you have to go back and sort of think, okay, but what, are, what is the mixture of cases in there and are we properly prioritizing those cases? One other thing I wanna make sure that you're aware of and, and that is that we have always intended to reconsider the, pre, the P1 criteria. And uh, that was uh, made clear to the board at the outset uh, in 2018 when the case prioritization was adopted. And with the adoption of the Odyssey case management system in early 2019, we are now in a position to determine how the criteria for P1 is impacting the percent of P1 cases in our inventory. As I mentioned, we, we always intended to look at that. And at this point, we have not made any changes because we're concerned that revising the criteria to reduce the percentage of high priority cases raises the potential for criticism from stakeholders that, uh, that we then have fewer of P1s in backlog and that, that, that the change was done for some sort of improper motive. Uh, but I wanna highlight for everyone that the number of P1 cases that we have in our inventory is above what our target was initially. Uh, and so that is something that we're gonna to have to consider, consider in the future. With that, I'll hand it back to Melanie. Um, before I begin my last piece, does anybody have any questions about anything that we've just covered? Okay, so a couple of other. I see Trustee, no, I... So, I see Trustee Sowell's no, hand up. Yeah, okay. and Sorry. I, I was getting there too. Uh, I, I saw uh, Trustee. Yes, Trustee Sowell also. You know, I, I appreciate um, Steve walking us through uh, walking us through the prioritization. I guess um, I'm still struck by the notion that the that the backlog is increasing, and it is of less priority cases. But you know, a less priority case uh, to us is still an important case to whoever to whoever the complainant was. And so I'm I'm just wondering is uh, is there still some sort of a timeline to try to get through some of those lower priority cases how far how how far backlogged are we maybe from a time standpoint that's a great question and the answer is yes one of the things that as melanie pointed out uh the office and the bar as a whole have been judged by the backlog number on one day out of the year for 30 years and what we have tried to do is to transition uh, because the statute isn't written that way. It doesn't say it falls into backlog on December 31st. It says it falls into backlog after 180 days, but, but it was only reported out on for one day. And so one of the things that we have tried to do is move from a December 31st backlog day to a rolling 180 day backlog and sort of make sure that we're understanding that those cases are in backlog, whether it's December 31st or you know, June 10th. And so keeping a focus on that is one thing. And we've also developed uh, quarterly goals and those goals are defined by the age of cases. But what we have done is had a, had a much lower number uh, for the age of the case for different categories of cases. So we have, uh, we are trying to be consistent with the case prioritization system by prioritizing P1 cases. Uh, and the expectation again is that P2 cases would, would move uh, relatively quickly. Uh, and what we're trying to do is with an understanding of the number of cases that we have, trying to consistently lower uh, the expectation for how long a P3 case would take. Uh, so yes, the answer is we are still mindful of those P3 cases. We're not uh, simply saying it's just a P3, we're gonna let it sit and, and go on forever. Uh, but we're, uh, we're trying to process the inventory in a way that is consistent with the case prioritization. So Steve, maybe you can give an example of um, 
because uh, I won't do it justice, but you know, a quarterly goal might be to um, to complete ten percent, you know, X percent or X number of cases in, and this, these are goals for each investigator or, or each attorney to meet. Complete, you know, ten percent or some number of of cases that are of P three cases that are in your inventory and are older than X number of days. Maybe you can give an actual an actual example, just because because I think it's a it's a totally fair question. Like we still need to be moving these cases. Um, backlog the backlog concept exists for a reason, and so um, so helping sort of folks understand what the types of things that we are. Um, that we are are asking our investigators and our attorneys to to make to do to make sure that they're processing these cases. And Steve, when you conclude, I'd just like to note that Sonia, uh, Trustee Delen has her hand raised, and so we're going to recognize uh, Trustee Delen following your, your response here. Sure. Uh, so I'll I'll try and be brief because the introduction of the quarterly goals has been a, a long process, and it's and it has changed quite a bit over time. Uh, but to point to the sort of the best example is the most recent quarterly goals for, for the first quarter of 2021. Um, and we have divided up the cases. Uh, and I should say that, that the only way we could have done this is, is with the implementation of a more modern case management system and with the assistance of ORIA. ORIA has been invaluable in this process by helping us come up with reports and things that allow us to do this. But what we have done is we have identified all of the P1 cases that by the end of the quarter will, will be uh, of a certain age in the investigative ranks. Uh, and then we'll have a certain amount of time in the pre-filing uh, stage. And so we have set uh, as a aspirational goal, trying to resolve all of those cases that are over a particular age. And for example, uh, the way that we have differentiated them between P P1 and P3, for example, is that the investigative uh, timeline for P1 cases, we have set at 135 days. So our goal we're not going to make it in all cases. And there are a number of reasons we can talk about for that, a number of legitimate reasons we can talk about for that. Um, but the goal is to move those, uh, those cases out of the investigative stage to the pre-filing stage within 135 days of their arrival in our office from what's called as the complaint file receive date. Um, now, that number may sound a little strange. Why 135 days? Well, the answer is that we have a pre-filing goal of moving cases that come into the pre-filing stage to either resolve it one way or another by filing it in state bar court uh, or realizing that it should not move forward and, and closing it uh, within 45 days. So those two added together are the 180 days based on the statute. We recognize that if we are prioritizing P1 cases that we are not gonna be able to meet those same same time standards for P3 cases. So our numbers there are higher. For example, in the pre-filing area, our target goal for P3 cases in pre-filing is 75 days. Higher than 45 days, but still reasonable. In the investigation uh, area, where the vast number of our P3 cases are, uh, the number is even higher, right? It's, uh, I think it's currently for this quarter, it's, our goal is 450 days, uh, which is too long. Um, but based on the number of cases that we're trying to process, that's where we felt it was uh, it, it was aggressive, but ho hopefully not unreasonable <clears throat> to set the goal there. And, and the expectation is that as the quarters progress, that number will slowly be uh, reduced to something that's even more reasonable. I don't, does that answer your question? Donna, uh, Donna's on mute. I'm going to ask Trustee Delen to go ahead and um, uh, ask you. her question. Thank you. Um, so I understand and I appreciate that uh, we have backlogs because uh, a huge backlog because of the number of investigators or, or attorneys assigned to the cases. Now, is there equitable distribution of uh, attorneys with respect to you know the whole the, you know, the cases that you have, or do you, do you really concentrate more uh, attorneys to P1 in, in the manner of, you know, so that we can get all 
priorities advanced and not just really putting people in just one or two baskets. So is there an equitable distribution so that it, everything is being advanced? I, I'm, I'm happy to answer that. I don't know, Melanie, if you wanna answer that. Go ahead. Okay, so uh, we have looked at different ways of, of assigning cases uh, and part of the problem just with, just as we mentioned with the office, if you prioritize everything, nothing is prioritized. So we felt it wasn't appropriate to give somebody, for example, 100% of their caseload is P1s, uh, because then they have no ability to prioritize those cases. And so what we have instead uh, tried to do is ensure that, that people have a reasonable percentage of their cases that are P1s versus P3s, so they have that ability to uh, know what case to focus on. Trustee Broughton has a hand raised. You're muted. Oh, sorry. Um, I've always had a problem with this notion of backlog, which is simply, to me, an arbitrary number of 180 days for every single case, regardless of how complicated the case is. I mean, as you pointed out, uh, Stephen, as you know the practice of criminal law, it takes a lot longer to do a homicide case than it does a petty theft, as you pointed out. So to me, and, and when you're talking about... Um, you know, 135 days uh, until you get to investigation, you're still working around the 180 days. So I, I'm wondering if, and we're gonna talk at some point about um, sort of legislative um, endeavors, is to take a look at this backlog number that they have arbitrarily put in here and, and, and really look at it in terms of, of um, how long should it take your most complicated cases? Some of those cases, those Armenian cases, took years of hard, hard, hard work before they could get completed. Uh, whereas the other cases, yeah, you can do them 180 days. So um, I've had a problem with this 180 day thing. And I think we should really take a look at it legislatively as we get into this. Okay. I don't, I don't see any hands raised. <clears throat> Melanie, are, so I'd like to move on in part also just because I want to make sure that we get through the end of the presentation, uh, Melanie, and then uh, get an opportunity for State Bar Court to speak. Sure, yes. I just had a couple of more um, comments, and actually some of them flow nicely from this discussion. Um, but things to sort of be aware of as we're moving forward with the commission in particular. Um, and Trustee Soul, you sort of pointed out one of them, and that is, you know, the, so the backlog is growing, and what are we doing about that? And, you know, part of the challenge in, in our system is um, what we heard earlier, that um, while we handle a number of different kinds of complaints, largely our inventory is complaint driven. Um, and so as a result, it really ebbs and flows. So over the years, for example, when we were in the recession and we had the um, loan mod crisis, we saw just thousands of complaints coming in about um, loan modification misconduct. Now, keep in mind that while now we are um, having more cases coming in, we still are working with the same number of resources to manage those cases. Um, also in 2018, when we uh, launched the online complaint portal, for about nine or 10 months, we saw a drastic increase in the number of complaints coming in with no corresponding uh, additional resources. So naturally, when, you're, when you have um, a finite number of resources, um, you are not going to be able to manage the entirety of the inventory. So we're trying to manage it in the way that makes most sense for public protection. That said, um, in 2020, we were able to add some resources. We had the benefit of the fee bill increase, and we added another team in Los Angeles, which necessarily will assist us in managing the inventory. But the reality is when you bring on new staff, you have to train them. And we are a very nuanced area of law. It takes quite some time, even for experienced attorneys, for example, to learn the area of law, to get to a place where they can competently manage an entire caseload to actually be impactful for the office. So, um, so I, I imagine in 2021, we'll start seeing the benefits of that new team. Um, 
A couple of other things, and it sort of touches on this uh, issue of discretion that Dag has mentioned. So, you know, one of the things also that is challenging about managing this inventory um, is that while we have some discretion here and there, um, most of our discretion is given to us by rule or statute. Um, we don't have um, complete discretion. And by that, I mean, um, we are a judicial branch agency, unlike a district attorney's office that is an executive branch agency. So we report to the California Supreme Court. Um, and as a result, for example, we do not have the discretion to simply close a case um, because we have determined that, that there is a lower classification of complaints that even if they are meritorious, we are not going to prosecute. Now that's different than a district attorney's office who is managing you know, a high number of um, criminal uh, complaints coming in um, and they can just decide that they are not going to prosecute um, cases that are sent to, sent to them by law enforcement agencies because they have more homicides than they do trespasses, for example, and they're going to place emphasis on the uh, homicide cases. Um, so we don't have the ability um, currently to simply decide that we're not going to handle a, a case that's potentially meritorious. Complaining witness, when we close a case, a complaining witness can always go to the California Supreme Court um, to seek relief, um, which would be essentially uh, the Supreme Court sending those cases back to our office to do something with them. Um, so as we think about sort of how we can better manage the inventory, as we think about sort of this, this idea of risk-based regulation, um, one of the things to think about is, do we have the tools? And if we don't, how, how could we get them um, so that everybody's on the, on the same page? So um, those were my comments, Dag, and I will uh, I'll send it back to you. Um, I have to say, I, I find it especially validating to, to hear you discuss the area of attorney discipline as being an especially nuanced uh, area of the law, because as a non-attorney and having been at the bar now for almost five years, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there's a steep learning curve that, that I have experienced in, in terms of trying to understand uh, the work that you do. And so it's, uh, it, it's like I said, validating. It's a, there's a lot going on in your office. It, it does tend to be nuanced, technically, um, technically um, detailed, and, um, and so I I share that also with the new trustees because you're going to be uh, you're going to be learning a lot about the attorney discipline system uh, as you uh, as you continue to work with the board of trustees. I would like to turn it over now to the state bar court. State bar court. Um, is in an, uh, as, as with any court, uh, is required to provide a, a neutral forum for the adjudication of cases. They are an independent, impartial body that uh, hears the cases that are brought by the Office of Chief Trial Counsel. And they're in, a, I think, a somewhat awkward position insofar as the judges um, sit, if not uh, literally, sometimes figuratively, with the seal of the State Bar of California behind them. And this has created a perception at times, uh, in particular among respondent attorneys, that somehow they are in cahoots with the Office of Chief Trial Counsel. I, I don't think that anything could be further from the truth, but uh, the perception um, is, is important nonetheless. And it's something that I think that the State Bar Court struggles with in terms of sure that uh, it doesn't ever give any uh, impression that uh, it favors one party over the other. The other issue that I think um, I wanted to touch on for this presentation and wanted uh, our clerk of the court, Michelle Crampton and court counsel, Rebecca Rosenberg to talk about was this question of case prioritization. I think we have come up with a, a, an exceptionally useful scheme for prioritizing cases according to what the State Bar of California's mission is that is codified in statute as well as in the mission statement which is to protect the public. That's what the state bar is all about. The state bar court has a slightly different mission insofar as the state bar court needs to be an independent arbiter. And that may not always coincide with the perception of OCTC in particular of what is the best method for protecting the public. And it also implies due process rights for the accused. So um, with that, I would like to uh, turn it over to Michelle Crampton and Rebecca Rosenberg. Thanks, Dag. Good morning, everyone. So um, 
Professor Sklar had posted a graphic, um, the inverted triangle to, to illustrate the discipline system. And as you may have noticed, at the very bottom point of the inverted triangle was the state bar court. And that is to illustrate the point at which the court enters into the discipline system. And that is when a case is filed by the Office of Chief Trial Counsel or otherwise initiated by an attorney or other party. Um, and with that, um, I, I'd like to do what Melanie did and take the opportunity to provide some background for board members as well as members of the public on how the court goes about that case adjudication once the case is filed. And that is all about timelines. The court has its own set of timelines that, um, that determines the flow of the case and the time frames um, for each stage of the case adjudication. So I'd like to um, quickly share my screen if I could. I'm going to take you to a couple different places um, and let you know where you can go to do a little for. Oh, I don't know if I have the cap. Do I have the capability to share? Oh, I do. You um, let you know where you can find this documentation on your own if you want to take a more detailed look later. So here's, here's where we're going to start. This is the State Bar Courts website. It's also known as the red site versus the State Bar's blue site. On the current notices page, if you scroll down to the last bullet here, you'll see a published report, the 2018 State Bar Court Performance Standards Report. Um, it's the 2018 report because it was published in 2019, and it's the last report that we have published. But the information is consistent with other years. So what I'd like to point you all to is um, the, the State Bar's own performance standards. And we're going to look at a timeline um, related to that. So the most common timeline is for an original case type or an O case type. The majority of cases filed by OCTC are O or original case types. And there's a standard timeline for those cases. But there's a variety of other case types and associated timelines that I'll briefly um, point you to. But the timelines that the court uh, uses to adjudicate the cases. The background on that is those are informed a by a couple of, of things. Those are informed by the National Center for State Courts, which um, recommends what the courts, including the state bar court, should measure, the areas that we should measure in the case adjudication process, like the overall pendency of a case or uh, uh, the submission period. Um, all of which is mentioned in this area. And then within those timelines, within those measurements, we apply time standards. And those time standards were basic, are basically determined, um, predominantly determined by the rules of procedure. There's rules regarding response time. There's rules regarding how long a, a case should be in submission status. But also um, back in the 90s when, when the, the timelines were first born, um, the American Bar Association time standards um, heavily influenced the state bar courts timelines. And that's all mentioned in, in this document as well. Um, so what I'd like to do is show you just scroll a few pages down, the typical O case type timeline. Um, and this is when the case is initiated in the hearing department. So this says on day one, the case is filed. And you can see from there, there's a specific number of days at which point certain events within the case adjudication have to occur. Um, if there's a motion for reconsideration, there's a new track. If it is appealed to the court's review department, a, a new track starts in the review department. Um, that said, so that's the basic timeline. So if you look at in the hearing department, that case should live in the hearing department for about 230 days. Once the, the decision is filed, the case has to wait to see if there's any um, request for review. If not, it's, it's closed and it's uh, transferred to the effectuations department to transmit it to the Supreme Court for the ultimate order regarding discipline. But that said, so the O case is the most common case type. The majority of OCTC case filings come in as O case types. But we have actually the last, we had 26 case types, but now I think we have 28. Anyway, it's not just the O case type. There's a variety, all of these different case types, each with their own particular timeline. So we just talked about the O timeline, which is here. 
these are all of the different stages of the adjudication and these had, I don't know why all those little, um, up here at the top, where the case is pending, when it's pending in hearing, when it's pending in review, when it's pending in effectuations, waiting to be transmitted to the Supreme Court, um, that sort of thing. Um, I also want to point out that within these various uh, case types, some of them already have expedited timelines. Um, and the one that I want to highlight for you is the TE case type, the one that's right here. Um, unlike the 265 days that, a, that an O case might pend in the hearing department, a TE case type only pens for 85 days at most because it is on an expedited timeline. For those of you not familiar with what a TE case type is, by rule, um, that is a case that is filed by, or a petition that's filed by OCTC because an attorney's conduct poses a substantial threat of harm to the attorney's clients or to the public. So when, when that occurs, when OCTC files that position, there may or may not be an accompanying O case type. Um, that case follows an expedited timeline for the purposes of public protection. Um, so I just wanted to point you to this information that's on the court's website so you can familiar familiarize yourself with that and see um, what's already in place with the court um, as far as a case adjudication process goes. Um, was there any questions on the timeline or the or the case types before we um, before we move on? I think I can stop my screen sharing too so we can see each other better. So, so Michelle, if I can if I can comment for the trustees. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think that was sort of helpful background to understand sort of how the, the the process of administration of a case. One of the things that Michelle and I have have, have talked about in the preparation for uh, for this presentation today, um, you know, the, it, it would be inappropriate for the court to, um, on its own, right, establish a policy of which which cases um, um, are sort of more are require a higher or in great a more greatly impact public protection and therefore should be should be expedited and so that's that's a discussion for the board and that's one of the reasons that we put this on the agenda today was was to to ask the question of whether there is a benefit to saying that the prioritization schema that OCTC put together makes it would make sense you know again whether it would make sense for the court to follow such a schema if so then you know the the board would need to adopt a rule pr providing for that and i think one of the things that michelle can help us understand is is what would be the the administrative challenges if any um of implementing such a such a rule um <clears throat> some of you may be familiar you know in in statute when it comes to um, when it comes to the superior courts, there are <clears throat> a number of statutes with calendar preferences um, that require certain case types to be handled more quickly, um, to the point that there are so many calendar preferences that I think it's nearly impossible for the courts to actually implement them. Um, so I think it, would, it might be helpful if the court were, if the board were interested in exploring this, this question further of should we be prioritizing certain cases not just through OCTC, but through the court system, is that something that the court, if a rule were adopted, be able to implement? Yeah, and thank you, Donna. That, that's what I was hoping to demonstrate by showing the, the, the different case types and um, uh, establish uh, and letting you know that there are timelines associated with those different case types. So if OCTC were to do something like designate a certain allegation um, that it wanted to give priority to that, that wasn't already that, that wasn't already met by using the existing timeline. If they wanted a separate, more expeditious timeline for that case and rules were adopted to facilitate that, the court would create a new timeline that conforms to that rule, just like we did when the rule was drafted and adopted regarding um, the, the public protection, the TE case type. The rule that was adopted for that is 5.225, 5.226 in the, in the rules of procedure. So once that rule was adopted, the court created the timeline to complement that rule. I see a question. 
Hi, it's Mark again. Steve, or, uh, Melanie, just so I'm, I'm clear, you know, I'm again talking about this backlog number, that's measured from the day at which you receive a complaint until you file that with the state bar court or, or dismiss it, I guess would be the thing. Is that correct? And so that chart that you just showed us, um, Michelle, measuring day one, mm -hmm. which has the 28 different types of cases, and all of those cases have different timelines from day one. Is that right? Yeah, I can put it back up there. Some of them have common timelines. Um, let me show. Let me share my screen real quick again. But to Mark's point, the court's day one is when yes. it's filed with the court. Right. The, the court's day one is essentially day 181. Um, you know, for for OCTC. Right. So again, it's to my point that you that OC that you know that the bar OCTC has only one single arbitrary number by which they are judged and yet the state bar court recognizes that um, there are different types of cases that require different types of timelines to get them um, completed so um, I, I just want to point that out at least to my own mind mm -hmm. I have a question for I don't know if it's for Melanie or Steve but if the board were to consider some proposed rule change to prioritize certain types of cases, um, is that, are there categories of cases that we have been, we meaning you and your staff have been wishing for or hoping for or looking at um, over the course of time? Well, <clears throat> I would imagine that pretty much any case that we had prioritized as a P1 we would want to see it move faster through the state bar court system, um, especially as compared to cases that are P3 cases, for example. So as it is now, um, just by way of example, if you have, uh, first of all, the, the state bar court doesn't know if we have a P1 or a P3 case, it's meaningless to them really at this point. Um, and if you have two cases set at the same time, um, there's no, and, and certainly the court staff can tell me if I'm wrong about this, but I don't think that there's any consideration given in terms of the seriousness of the case as to which one is going to move forward first um, if, there, if there are two cases assigned to the same judge for the same calendar dates. Um, so, so yes, I mean, I think it would make sense to me that the P1 cases would be prioritized in state bar court if that was the way that the board went. But would you want the 180 day backlog number to be modified for those P1 cases so that you could get a little more time that you need to do the investigation prior to filing? You wanna take that Steve? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, as much as we have tried to uh, meet that 180 day deadline and, and as much as, for example, in our quarterly goal for this quarter, uh, the P1 goal is to accomplish that. As I mentioned, there are a number of reasons that uh, cases can't reach that. And that's because they're, they're not within our control. They are, in essence, we're waiting for documents. We're waiting for subpoenaed records. We're waiting for documents from the federal government on immigration cases and things like that. And, and frankly, uh, as it, we, have, we have focused on our relationship uh, to expedite the uh, processing of our requests for documents in those matters, but oftentimes we're waiting for five or six months, which is eats up our 180 days right there. So I do think there needs to be something that is more uh, directly tied to the work that we do. Um, you know, there are some P1 cases that are not particularly complex. There are some that are very complex. And so we do need to recognize our ability to move cases and have that number be reflected in if we're going to uh, assign any real meaning to that backlog number, to that 180 days, that number has to be more directly tied to our work. Yes. And I agree with that. And one of the reasons I raised this point um, repeatedly, and I think Brandon has been around a few years ago, that your office, as you mentioned, has just been excoriated by having too many cases on backlog with, without regard to the fact that some of these cases do take so very long. And there was a period of time a few years ago where 
you know, this all came up in the legislature and we weren't going to get our fee bill passed and all this stuff. And they were all talking about this backlog number. So to me, it's unfair to your office to put all of these eggs in the same basket without really uh, measuring them appropriately. That's why I raised this. I just wanna um, be cognizant of the time. I wanna make sure that we really give you the full half hour that is scheduled between noon and 12.30 before we start with the paraprofessionals program presentation and the conversation that's uh, scheduled to, to take place on that topic. We have like 10 minutes between now and noon and I wanna make sure that uh, Michelle is able to finish her comments. Rebecca, if you had comments prepared to, to discuss on this topic, but also to see if we can um, get any remaining comments from the trustees on the topic of the attorney discipline system and planning for the uh, work that the ad hoc commission on the discipline system is going to be doing. Yeah, th thank you, Dag. Um, I, I would like to um, defer to Rebecca to see if she had any additional comments she wanted to make with respect to anything I said or anything she would like to um, say. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to make sure that we are all mindful that as we have certain timelines, we have to make sure that respondents are afforded due process as well as the Office of Chief Trial Counsel is provided due processes in, in those timelines. Mm -hmm. Also, as an independent and impartial adjudicatory, adjudicatory body, the State Bar, once again, is reactive. So if the Office of Chief Trial Oops. any a case early, that it will move through the system first. If they delay filing P3 cases, they would move through the system later in time. But we react to what the Office of Chief Council submits to us, but we cannot prejudge cases by determining something to have priority without a rule of procedure in place or a board policy guidance. Right. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you. Your, your audio is a little a little choppy. So, yes. But I think I think we got the got what you were saying. Was it was it Let's clear? Just to have yeah, let's have a fact check on that one. Hey, trustees, if you could nod your head if you understood the general um, points that uh, Ms. Rosenberg was making then. Okay, good, so did I. Um, and what I, if I could, just as an observation, when I was uh, vice chair of the RAD committee working with Brandon, I really did see um, in play and in action that, in action, not in action, um, that independence of the state bar court and, and really the, uh, the stridency with which they um, strive to, to maintain that neutral uh, adjudicatory judge-like role. Um, and it was not, not surprising to me, but it was reassuring to see that respondents um, are treated with, you know, with the, the, the amount of um, fairness and due process and complainants are, you know, likewise. And so, um, I just wanted to make that observation in my role as, uh, as a vice chair, former vice chair of RAD. Brandon, you may have something to offer as well in that regard. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, so one of the things I was really impressed with and continue to be impressed by is the uh, bench bar uh, coalition. And that's uh, something that the state bar court uh, sets up on a bi-monthly basis. And it's a chance for OCTC, RAD, and then the uh, discipline council uh, to meet with state bar court and really handle some of these issues um, just on an, in a collaborative uh, way. Um, and I've, I really uh, appreciate the state bar court taking leadership in, um, in areas that affect both the prosecution as well as the defense side. And uh, I've also appreciated the state bar courts, um, I think as Ruben said, the tenacity in which they approach uh, their independence. And so um, that's always, been I greatly appreciated uh, by myself and, and by other members of RAD. Thank you, Brent. <clears throat> so I would just comment that <clears throat> um, there's nothing inherently wrong with the 180 day number, right? Um, 
uh, you know, Steve and Melanie talked about some, about some of the challenges. Um, those challenges, yes, there are absolutely things that are outside of our control, but that's gonna always be the case no matter what the number is. Um, the issue goes to resource allocation, right? Um, uh, the state bar did a, a resource, uh, um, a workload study um, to assess what would it take in terms of resources, um, additional OCTC resources, investigators, attorneys, et cetera, for us to be able to meet the 180 day goal. Um, we very much appreciated that um, in 2019, the, the fee increase that the legislature authorized for the bar included funding for, um, I think it was 14 or 19 additional OCTC staff to create a new in, one new enforcement team. Um, based on the workload study we had done, we, we asked for 58 additional staff and they said, well, there's no way, they said accurately, there's no way you're gonna hire 58 staff all at one time, right? No question, that's true. Um, um, let's, you know, authorize one new enforcement team and let's see what that does. And so we do, we have um, that funding started, uh, uh, the, the fee increase uh, was effective with the fee bill um, this past year. And so effective January, this we're in January now. So January, 2020, um, we were collecting that, the additional re revenue that would allow us to staff this team. Um, Melanie um, did in fact ultimately staff a brand new enforcement team. And so we'll be looking at what that um, increment of additional resources um, is able to accomplish. And we'll also be conducting um, this spring, I believe the plan is to conduct a, another workload study either in a similar fashion or maybe a slightly different fashion than we did a few years ago. Again, sort of to identify and um, based on changes in case processing, based on the case management system um, that we have implemented, what would it take staff resource wise in order to be able to meet that 180 days? Um, so, so it's not like we are sort of criticizing 180 days as a bad number. Um, we simply don't have the, have the resources that would enable us to meet it on a more regular basis. And it's, and it's why it's among the reasons that we, um, that we sort of took the step back to come up with the innovative approach to case prioritization and, um, um, and start focusing our resources in a way we should on those cases that, that have a greater impact on public protection, not losing sight of the others, still trying to meet goals, um, but understanding that without the full set of resources that we think we need in order to meet the statutory goal, um, we need to decide which cases to move first. So I just, I'm off my soapbox, but I just wanted to make sure that, that I didn't, that, that we weren't left with the sense that we, we just need to change the 180 days. We don't, we don't think the number is fair. It's that it just doesn't link up um, as closely as it needs to with our resources. Uh, I'd like to, sure. I could just real quick um, and mindful of the time, Melanie or Steve, could you just give a, a brief summation of some of the issues that we've seen in the last year uh, regarding the uh, rise in inventory, you know, as it relates to staffing issues, uh, the time it takes to get a case through intake with some of the added reporting requirements, um, and just some of the uh, things that you are mindful of and are working, um, you know, working on to make sure that our timelines um, are as consistent as possible. Well, so, First of all, I mean, I will say that for much of 2020, we actually saw a decrease in the numbers of complaints coming in. Um, and I presume that's because of what's going on in the world. So it remains to be seen what those numbers will look like uh, in 2021. But um, yes, when we uh, launched the online complaint portal in October 2018 and through July of 2019, there was a drastic increase in the number of complaints. Um, while people were, <clears throat> excuse me, filing complaints online, there was not a corresponding decrease in the number of complaints that were coming in um, on paper. And what it had the effect of essentially uh, a accumulating uh, a large amount of complaints at the intake stage, um, because again, sort of what I had referred to before, we can't account for ebbs and flows because we only have the resources we have. So um, what we ended up doing uh, in later 2019 
in order to, to get those cases moving is that we allocated them out to the entire attorney staff in uh, OCTC. So not just the folks that are assigned to intake. So in fact, Steve and I took some as well. Um, and we actually did, did the intake on those cases, um, which had the effect of, you know, many of them resolving by closing, because we know that that often happens at the intake stage, but um, that the, um, the complaints that were moving forward because of the way we did it, they sort of all moved forward at the same time. So now you have the, this large volume of complaints that started in intake. Now they're all moving forward as a large volume of complaints into investigations. Um, and you can imagine the impact of that for the staff and investigations that now their caseloads are rising um, and it's taking longer, you know, long term for those cases to resolve. And really in 2020, um, we, we saw the effect of that, that movement of um, those cases in late 2019. So even though in 2020, we've we've seen less complaints coming into intake, it doesn't mean that our, uh, our overall inventory, at least in investigations and pre-filing has been reduced because those staff are still working uh, through those cases um, that have moved forward. Now, obviously we're going to see a decrease and that we'll start actually feeling the benefits in investigations and pre-filing from the lower rate of complaints in 2020. Um, I would, I would assume as soon as uh, the first quarter of 2021. Um, but, you know, it, it's certainly on our radar screen when you think about having had that experience, um, sort of looking for those signs of, um, you know, what's coming next in terms of uh, volumes of complaints potentially coming into intake. And then how can we allocate the resources we have um, to try and manage those complaints a little bit more proactively so we don't see that happen again uh, in the future. I would also like to point out that the uh, State Bar Court as well as OCTC um, and Defense Bar have really worked uh, in a collaborative way to bring about um, hearings, including evidentiary hearings, uh, to keep uh, cases moving along even during uh, the pandemic. Uh, so it's required a lot of uh, technological uh, innovations and training. And so just want to applaud the efforts of State Bar Court and defense as well as the OCTC in ensuring that respondents get their day in court and you know, in, even in the midst of a, uh, a pandemic that has really impacted us on so many different levels. So um, just wanted to point that out for uh, State Bar Court. So given, given the time, I uh, would like to commit staff to uh, summarizing separately instead of taking uh, breaking into your lunch hour and summarizing now and distributing a summary of um, what we've gleaned from this conversation and what we hope to contribute to uh, the ad hoc commission as a result of this meeting and turn it back over to uh, Vice Chair Duran. Okay. Um, looks like the trustees are okay with that approach which according to our agenda then would just take us to a 30 minute lunch break. Am I correct in that? I am hungry, don't know about you folks. It is uh, 12.03, can we do a 27 minute lunch break or would you want your full half hour? We'll see you back here at uh, 12.30 folks. Enjoy your lunch, thanks. <laughs>